It also saves lives, prevents people from doing stupid stuff. If you look on the internet, you will see many examples, not only of Lawrence police people, but other police, politicians, doing some things that were not the smartest thing in the world to do. I was sent an email from the police chief. It was also sent to Craig Owens. I was made aware of the profanity that you have heard from officers. Yada, yada, yada. Sergeant Ernst, apologize. Thank you, Ron. An apology? Any other general public comment? Hi, I'm Caitlin McDermott, 1000 Mississippi, a 14 year resident of Lawrence. Uh, first off, I wanna thank everyone who comes out to these meetings and the commissioners and others sitting up front. I left last week's study session both hopeful and defeated. I was hopeful because the commissioner seemed, to receptive, seemed receptive to concrete change or the dismantling of the city codes on aggressive panhandling and illegal camping. They also sounded like they would consider the expansion of bed limits at church-based emergency shelters, although it took Mr. Flowers to remind them that they left it off the agenda. I believe they agree that we need a comprehensive, multiple agency supported, housing first, long-term plan for ending houselessness in our community. I was defeated because of the slow pace that any action resulting from these opinions seemed to take. Winter is not over. By the time the commissioners consider changing the bed limit on the emergency shelter, it will be another month since they were first asked to consider it. I want everyone to really think about this as they leave this meeting. They bundle up in their coats against the wind, appreciate their car's heated seats, and their cozy homes waiting for them. For many of our community members, this is not their daily reality. Until a comprehensive plan can be put into place, until we come to a community agreement on a way for our unsheltered members to exist fairly in our city, until we can get to those points in time, we must provide shelter options for our community members. I humbly ask the commissioners to make an immediate decision for the expansion of bed limits in the emergency shelters. Now, tonight, so that you, the commissioners, our most vulnerable community members, the unsheltered, and myself can rest easy tonight and for the rest of winter. Thank you. Good evening, Madam Mayor, Vice Mayor, Commissioners. My name is Ted Boyle, President of North Lawrence Improvement Association. And uh, I'd like to thank you uh, for coming back over to North Lawrence on the depot and uh, installing more Christmas lights and making on the depot and around the depot and uh, making uh, North Lawrence feel like they were part of the city. Uh, the first attempt to light the depot was very poorly <coughs> done and uh, after talking to the mayor and commissioners uh, Parks and Rec director went over there and uh, did a wonderful job of decorating it. So maybe next year we can get a little better at it since we've uh, got the downtown zoning in North Lawrence now. So I just wanted to thank you for that. And the other deal is, is uh, we sent you a letter uh, about the depot and maybe future use. And this was the second letter that I've sent to the commission about this and one was more historical uh, documentation of North Lawrence, Jefferson. You know, we were there first. Jefferson was there long before there was anything even on this side of the river. And then in 1870, we became part of Lawrence. Uh, and uh, you know, that's been a struggle 
from there to now. And so we would like some history, more history, uh, maybe put it in the depot. And also, uh, Barbara Dover, she has that uh, historical River Kings about the men and the Call River. And since we're starting to use the river, uh, future plans for recreation and that type of deal, maybe the public would like to know some history of the river and how it affected North Lawrence and Lawrence. And uh, so we would like to see that display in the depot, the River Kings. And last time I talked to her, she had taken a job in Kansas City and that uh, display has moved from the Marriott and gone to Kansas City, Kansas now. And what the hell is it doing in Kansas City, Kansas when it's a North Lawrence, Lawrence, Call River history? So uh, the residents of North Lawrence would like to see that in the depot and more historical uh, projects or history of uh, North Lawrence and Jefferson. Thank you. Any other general public comment? Hi, I'm Chris Flowers. The past couple of weeks, the mayor has put an end to applause in an effort to make people feel safer and more welcomed when making comments. I think that's a good goal, but I've been doing some thinking about it, and I'm not sure I like this policy. First, the timing is a bit suspicious. This new policy comes shortly after the meeting in which the shelter advocates were here, and the crowd got a bit worked up, and the night ended with a brick through the mayor's window. I'm not sure, but in my opinion, there is a correlation between that night and this new enforcement of, new, of no applause after comments. I'm not sure that making everyone feel welcomed is the sole reason for not allowing applause. I think part of this policy is to keep us citizens from getting worked up into a frenzy. Last week when the shelter advocates were here, the energy was different than last month when they were able to clap and show support for each other. My problem with the policy that makes us sit in silence is that it's a policy that also takes away passion and emotion. If a citizen gets up and makes a point, by telling a, a moving personal story, I think clapping would be a more welcoming, supportive response than sitting in silence and staring. Also, by not letting people applause after someone makes a comment, you are effectively shushing us, and nobody likes to be shushed. I'd also like to add who you are shushing. When there is clapping here, it usually happens when a group that has younger people in it is here for an issue. So I ask, how appropriate is it that the commission, a pretty white group of middle-agers, shushes a group that is young and diverse? I've been saying for a long time we need more young folks coming to these meetings, and this new policy of sitting in silence the whole time is not welcoming for them. For people that may not feel comfortable making public comments, I'd argue they should write the commission an email, and then their written communication would be included in the agenda under correspondence. An alternative to public speaking to begin with is a better solution than changing how people react to public comments. So, in conclusion, do a better job of letting people who aren't comfortable with public speaking know they can write into the commission and be included in the agenda packet. And let people clap after someone is done making comments. Also, I don't support taking away our free speech to make us more complacent. Progress happens when people are pissed off, not when they are complacent. Thank you. Here, here. Any other general public comment? Uh, Dan Dannenberg, 2702 University Drive. Uh, it's been noted that the uh, position of Director of Planning and Development Services is uh, still open. Uh, don't know what the status on that is. We have a person here identified as Interim Director I think that because this is a very important position in the community, 
the process of filling it should be transparent to all members of the community, uh, not just the ruling oligarchy. Uh, the chamber, developers, uh, we'll see the short-term rental people later on, and the other landlords. Uh, this position affects a lot of the community at large. And I think we need to have a certain degree of, not a certain degree, we need to have transparency. Uh, so we know what's going on, who's getting the job, who's qualified, who's not qualified, how the selection process went. Uh, because as I say, it's a very important position. And all you have to do is drive around town a little bit and uh, look at some of the, uh, what I call, uh, urban disasters. Uh, the most recent one that comes to mind is the uh, quick shop and uh, fuel station at the northeast corner of Mississippi and 9th Street. Whoever came up with that was really, really, I mean, that was a real planning gem. Uh, with the traffic there and everything, wow. What happened? I don't know but it certainly doesn't look good. And let's have a little bit of uh, community input on who gets this position, not just the, uh, as I say, the ruling oligarchy. Any other general public comment? Um, I did want to refer the question regarding the depot space to staff um, yeah. to consider as we move forward, I know we talked about the Santa Fe station at one point. Um, so just having a conversation about that, whether it's internally with staff, I don't necessarily mm -hmm. know that bringing it back to the commission at the moment is necessarily. Uh, yeah, I think we should explore it. Most yeah. Potential uses along that line. You mean for the displays? For inside the of inside the. the displays, not the holiday. Correct. No. Yes. No. Yes. No. Um, is there any update on the process for hiring the planning director that you all would want to share? Sure. Um, I, I do believe we've done uh, initial cuts of uh, the applications, and uh, we're looking to schedule some interviews to block some time out for interviews, but we haven't set anything up specifically. Um, I will, you know, kind of... Uh, uh, update that uh, the process that um, that we'll be following will use community stakeholder panels uh, but it is not going to be an open process to the public and the primary reason for that is um, to get the very best candidate pool we can um, when a candidate from wherever they are uh, places themselves out into the the public uh, public eye, they're taking a risk of maybe souring the relationship with their current employer, I assuming they have one. And I think we need to have the very best uh, candidate pool we can, the broadest candidate pool we can. And I think people that are nervous about exposing themselves to their current employer, uh, that risk is going to reduce our, our candidate pool. So I, I absolutely understand uh, and respect the uh, process. Uh, that, have, that has been used, for instance, when I was hired uh, within the last year. Uh, but I do think that trying to get the very best applicant pool, the people that were, are going to lead us and do the important work that was mentioned here, uh, is what we're most committed to. And, and I, I, I will say that um, we, I do believe deeply in um, getting a broad spectrum of, of uh, community members and panelists to try and uh, make sure that we haven't missed some of those perspectives. Thank you. One thing, one thing, if I could add, um, Mayor, is um, that there was an extensive survey that was done in the community. We got really good response on the profile for the position, so we took a lot of public input in that. Thanks. Part of the process. I appreciate that. Okay, I think we are ready to move on to our regular agenda items. Item number one is consider adopting on first reading ordinance number 9737, which amends sections 2402 and 2403 of chapter 20, land development code, to permit non-owner occupied short-term rental units as a use by right in all zoning districts, thus eliminating the current requirement of a special use permit in ordinance number 9740, which establishes new licensing and procedural guidelines within the short-term rental property code.
Good evening, Mayor, Commissioners. Brian Jimenez, Code Enforcement Manager for the City of Lawrence with the Planning Development Services Department. I'll be uh, spearheading the uh, majority of the presentation, followed up by Jeff Crick, our Planning Manager, on some of the uh, development code. With two new commissioners and a new city manager, um, we thought it was important that we would sort of give um, a good history of how we got here. So bear with me with some of these dates. They it might be a little bit boring, but I think it's important to tell you how we got to, to, to tonight's meeting. Um, on September 26, 2017, we initiated the process with a stakeholder meeting in this room. It was well attended. We also continued with a Lawrence Listen survey to get uh, public input feedback about um, short-term rentals, how they wish us to proceed in regard to licensing, inspecting them, and also to see if there was any similarities between the long-term program. That led to November 14th, 2017, where we had a work session with the City Commission, and we got additional direction um, to move forward with um, pursuing a, a short-term um, rental licensing ordinance and, and amending the development code. I refer to SDRs as short-term rental throughout this presentation. On February 20th, 2018, City Commission in initiated tax amendments to allow STRs in all zoning districts. And then we followed it up in the fall of 2018, where we had um, ordinances 9481 and 9560 to permit and regulate short-term rentals throughout the city. That adoption on October the 2nd of that year um, Establish an effective date of the short-term licensing ordinance on November 1st of 2018. At that time, we then started the program. Um, there was two important things to know about that is there was two distinct paths of compliance. We identified owner-occupied. We uh, defined it. We defined non-owner-occupied. The non-owner-occupied short-term rentals um, would have to go through a special use permit on our planning side which would go before the Planning Commission and ultimately um, your body as well. And some of you may remember those um, special use permits that we did last uh, late winter, early spring of last year. So with that adoption, we started licensing all the owner-occupied short-term rentals immediately. Um, that's a very similar process to our long-term. It's a rental application. All the relevant information is put on that application and we issued the license fairly quickly within several business days, no later than that. The current program affects two chapters of the code. Chapter six, article 13A, which is the short-term rental licensing inspection, licensing inspection ordinance, and chapter 20 of the city's land development code. As I mentioned, there's two different paths of uh, compliance. Um, land development code required all non-owner occupied to obtain a special use permit and we began uh, licensing the uh, owner-occupied immediately and started the process of the special use permit for the non-owner-occupied. Not too long into that process for the special use permit for non-owner-occupied, we realized it was going to be problematic for various reasons. One was due to the length of time for approval. Another one was the cost. It was substantially higher than the um, relative um, minimal um, fee for the owner-occupied. And it had to go to before the Planning Commission for approval, and then it, it followed up with a, approval before you. Um, so there were some frustrations there on applicants. Um, we understood those frustrations. So we brought that um, back to you in the spring of last, of, of last year. On May 14th, City Commission session discussed the SUP process, and um, the current commission at that time directed us to do the following things. Ensure predictability and consistency of the program for all parties. Maintain public engagement in the approval process. Consider impacts to affordable housing. And look for potential concentration of short-term rentals in certain neighborhoods throughout the city. That work session led to us coming back on July 2nd. And we presented two options to consider based on the uh, direction we received the, following, uh, the previous month. One was to establish one license process for all STRs, allowing them by right in all zoning districts, and to amend the ordinance to require annual notice to neighbors at the time of license renewal, create a process by which owners can object to license being requested. 
Continuing, also wanted to strengthen the probation and revocation process of a license. And just as importantly, research the ability to place a limit of the maximum number of SDRs that one entity, business, corporation, LLC, et cetera, could own um, and operate within the city. So what we came up with was Ordinance 9740. Uh, Jeff will speak at a little bit about Ordinance 9737 that amends the development code, land use. I'm going to highlight just the important parts that are significant that um, we've changed since we last spoke to you about this. Um, under definitions, we added the director definition. We removed owner-occupied and non-owner-occupied because we are now suggesting or proposing a one-step of compliance. Therefore, the owner-occupied and non-owner-occupied definitions under what we have proposed are no longer needed. We also added new language in 13A03B to limit a maximum number of three short-term rental licenses at any one time for any um, business entity. Um, uh, Randy Larkin with our city attorney's office um, has um, provided that language on that code section. Um, therefore, if there's any questions about legality and anything like that, uh, Randy will be um, happy to answer those. And we revised language for new notice requirements upon initial licensing and renewal of license. Currently, the code requires a property owner that's going to want to do short-term rental, owner-occupied and non, to provide notice to people within 200 feet of their property. And they are required to provide us a um, copy of that letter that they've sent out to those neighboring properties. To stiffen up the process and, and follow the commission's direction, we've changed that language and I'll, get, I'll talk a little bit about that here in a second, but basically that requirement is now going to be an annual requirement upon renewal as well. So not only during the initial process, but the annual licensing process, that person, that applicant, that licensee would once again do that 200 foot notice to property owners or surrounding the property for the transparency um, that we wish um, to continue with. We also added uh, new language for denial for a uh, habitual violator and we added uh, when a valid objection has submitted has been submitted so the objection that you're going to see in the ordinance is the significant addition that we made that's going to be a, a, a availability to the uh, neighbors that they will be able to do at the time of their notification from the <coughs> applicant that they want to renew or initiate a license Um, we also thought it would be important to require licenses to be slayed on all listing platforms. So if you're looking on Airbnb or, or any of the other platforms, um, we think it would be relevant and important for us, too, to know who's licensed, that that license that we've issued them is, is placed on their ad for, for anyone that's renting that property or for city staff <coughs> looking at those properties, that the license is, 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 is on that um, platform. We also added new language identifying required date of mailing the renewal notice. We changed it up a little bit. We gave a little bit more leeway for the applicant to submit the renewal and gives us a little bit more time to process those licenses. As you will see towards the end of the presentation, we don't have more than 70 licenses right now, so it's not an overwhelming thing that we, um, that we can't take on. Traditionally, towards the end of the year, our long-term rentals renewals slow down, so we find that that time is adequate for us to do that. Then we also separated requirements by A, B, and C on, on that um, code language. We also eliminated the tax submittal requirement. Um, the current code requires them to submit um, taxes, transient guest tax, any, any relevant state and federal tax. And I had people calling me left and right saying, what do you want from me? I don't know what to give you. And that was really problematic. So we had a meeting with Jeremy. I know Jeremy is not here tonight. And we talked to him. And basically, we landed on that that's handled through the finance department, what information they can get. So we thought it was pertinent to eliminate that tax information, as we don't require that for long-term rentals either.
So moving on to the objections, that's the major part of the um, additions to the uh, proposal. Um, before, on a renewal, you simply were able to submit your license for an owner-occupied or an SUP for non, and you we would issue that license. No questions asked, we'd process it. Now, a person with that notification from the applicant has the ability to submit a objection with the director, and that objection will be reviewed administratively first. Um, there's quite a bit of language here, and I'll go through it. The thinking behind that is we do it administratively to try to cut down on unnecessary time, taking it to a appeal board, and hopefully we can resolve the issues in that capacity without taking it further. It's important to note that the person submitting the objection to why the license should not be renewed, it's their burden of proof to provide us information, whatever it may be. We haven't obviously done this before, but based on the totality of the circumstances, that they believe we, the city, should not renew their license based on um, all kinds of possible factors. Um, maybe it's police calls to the property documented. Maybe it's six noise disturbances um, that occurred late at night that the PD can substantiate that they responded to those calls. Maybe it's some documented criminal activity. Anything that would be good evidence, the burden of proof is on them to show it's more likely than not that those things occurred and it's been causing or violating um, their right to peaceful enjoyment or causing some type of hazard or safety concern for the neighboring property owners. It's also important to note the way this code is written, the director shall have broad discretion to determine whether the person who objects has sustained his, his or her burden of proof. So um, I imagine if when, I, I imagine we would get one of those. Um, we would look at everything very closely, get other staff involved, and then we would make an uh, administrative decision on whether that is valid or denied. If we deny it within 30 days of submission, uh, that person aggrieved has the ability to appeal that administrative decision to the Building Co Code Board of Appeals. That would be the next step. Currently, short-term rental status, we have 63 licensed properties in the, state, in the city right now. Of those, those are four non-owner occupied that were approved last spring through the special use permit. If, if for the uh, commissioners that were here last spring, if you remember, we did, the, the commission did deny one SUP for a house in a single dwelling district on Holiday Drive. So the other ones are pretty much um, multifamily zoning districts. I think there's a couple of apartments, but there's four SUPs that are still out there approved. We have 48 pending. And what that means is we have 48 properties that we have identified that were either those SUP people that were put on hold and that we need to follow up with them, or there are additional properties that we've located that we don't know if they're non-owner occupied or owner occupied, but we need to track them. So when we do get a, a resolution to, to uh, what we're trying to accomplish with the new ordinance, that we don't forget about those people. So I don't want you to think that all 48 of those are non-owner occupied STRs, because they're probably more likely about 30 of those. We have 56 inactives, which we had opened up a case at some point since November of 2018. That can be a variety of reasons why they're inactive. Um, they tried it, they didn't like it, they sold the property, it turned to long term. Um, so that, there's a, a lot of reasons why that is there. It's important to note that in previous discussions before you, the, a lot of times there was like 180, 200 um, short term rentals mentioned throughout the city. That's true if you simply go to Airbnb and look at the number, you might see that many. What you will find is there are properties in LeCompton, there's properties in Baldwin, Eudora, um, there are properties that have been listed multiple times. So um, I have a staff member that's really good at this, so we're really confident that if we license all the 48 pending, we'd probably have anywhere between 110 and 120 throughout the whole city. Here's the short-term rental map as of two weeks ago. It gets updated daily if something changes. 
Um, the uh, four purple dots are the um, SUPs. The yellow dots are um, all the other properties that are licensed throughout the city. As you can see, there might be a little bit more heav heavily concentration in the um, east side of Iowa Street, south of 6th Street. But as you can see, we have them all the way out far west and south and, and northwest as well. I also would like to note that on uh, January 29th, I believe, we mailed out a notification to all the SUP people that were put on hold and everyone that was impending of this meeting tonight to be as transparent as possible to provide them the opportunity to come speak tonight as well. I think at this point I'll let Jeff uh, take over and finish up and then if there's any questions at the end I'll, I can come back up and answer those. Good evening, Commission. Jeff Crick with the City County Planning Office. Just a quick overview of the parts related to the Land Development Code here. Uh, existing. Can you, can you pause for just a second? I think we have a group that's Certainly. leaving, and I don't want to. No, that's okay. I just don't want you to get on a roll. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for, for coming. Being here. Yeah. Thank you. Good night. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, just a reminder of the, of the current code, the way it works right now. It is a residency-based item, so there's a difference between an owner-occupied and a non-owner-occupied short-term rental in the code currently. An owner-occupied requires an accessory use to the principal structure. A non-owner-occupied requires a special use permit, which does go before the Planning Commission, before consideration, before the ultimate approval by the City Commission. The use regulations that are associated with the standards are typically related to occupancy, parking, uh, property appearance, such as making sure it doesn't have a commercial parking lot, lighting standards, those kind of details to it. And it also requires one parking space per guest room. Those are really the, the big standards of the current program today. The amendment kind of goes and ties directly into that common licensing procedure. So the revised ordinance for the Land Development Code would remake, or excuse me, would make it a permitted use subject to the use standards in all residential zoning districts that have a residential component to it, almost all of them, uh, with the notable exception of a Greek housing district. And then this would also include commercial and industrial districts that have residence components to it also. So they would be a permitted use in those items there. The use regulations have been revised to kind of really take a look at and address a couple of different items. One is the parking requirement. The other one is to talk about the difference between owner-occupied and non-owner-occupied. But the key change, I really think, in that section is the initial use determination. The code would require that you cannot establish short-term rental as a use for a construction or renovation purpose. It has to be a different use, such as a detached dwelling, an apartment, uh, another use that's in the code as your initial establishment. That would then set your parking requirement. But you could do a special, or excuse me, do a short-term rental as a use once that's been determined. So the initial use of the structure has to be determined by a different use. The parking and loading access standards would just match the principal use that was used to determine to construct or renovate the structure itself. And the definition was revised in the code to bring it more in line with the definition requirements for just between the owner and occupied and non-owner occupied, just remove that item out of there. This amendment was before the Planning Commission at their October meeting, and they recommended its approval to you at an 8 to 1 vote. With that, I'd be glad to stand for any questions that you have related to the items. Any questions for staff? No. Are you pulling up questions? Oh, okay. I'm good. I'm good for now. Anybody? They're coming. Okay. They're coming. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Is that all the presentation we have on this item? Okay. Then I guess we'll open it up for public comment. Dan Dannenberg, 2702 University Drive. Uh, based on the riot that the uh, short-term rental uh, property owners and representative uh, staged 
uh, not long ago here at the city commission and that the city commission was uh, uh, very very willing to let the riot go on and applause and all like that uh, I'm sure the fix is in uh, rental properties destroy neighborhoods residential neighborhoods do I have data no the only thing I have is that's the general impression and these short-term rental properties Airbnb I don't know what I don't know who knows they will be they are nothing more than motels motels that when the football team at the university becomes successful providence forbid these will be weekend party shacks and people will move in and there will be parties that go on saturday night into sunday morning and boy it will be just a good time for all the liquor will flow and uh, the rest of us can take a hike if we don't well, like the noise in our neighborhood there is and we hear about affordable housing affordable housing is like uh, military intelligence it's an oxymoron there will be no affordable housing in Lawrence that's not going to happen with all these rental properties that people are buying there's a unit that is about two doors from mine that has been vacant for years it was recently remodeled about last year and it is still vacant it has a for sale sign in front of it two hundred thousand dollars well it's not sold and it's probably not going to be sold until it can get a license as a short-term rental property i.e. a motel and we have uh, I sure I'm sure more than one commissioner who wants motels in residential areas my street where I live on is all rental properties except for a few and it is not a good circumstances or atmosphere for owner occupied for residences like mine maybe I should move out well I've dug in my heels and I've said well I've been here this many years I'm going to hold on and see if I can survive this uh, this uh, siege and attack from the short-term rental property owners other public comment hello my name is Walt Onisworge at 20th and Ohio I'm sorry mayor I couldn't catch his last name Onisworge O-H-N-E-S-O-R-G-E -E. thanks um, I've just uh, become somewhat interested in this uh, topic um, I'm a social worker and an artist and I've lived in Lawrence most of my life. I grew up here. I've been a renter, and uh, I've been I've had the pleasure of being a co-owner, um, helping pay so many, uh, helps helping somebody else to pay the mortgage in, in my home. Um, and as an artist and a social worker, I have a pretty clear understanding that I am not going to have a retirement. Um, also, just to be really perfectly clear, there isn't strictly speaking any affordable housing in Lawrence like that's kind of a myth that's a total myth um, but as um, someone who takes care of my own home I've been looking into the possibility of uh, maybe one day buying another home that I could rent out and when I look at properties online that I would like to buy I look at properties that are dilapidated and need my help um, and I'm not saying that this is everybody I've I've lived under slumlords in this city um, and there's two houses in North Lawrence side by side for sale by one of them at this very moment that's kind of beside the point what I'm what I'm getting at is that my end game for some someday not working um, it has to include some kind of working and and my hope is that I'll be able to rent in this town to somebody else and it's it's in some sense I feel like it's sleazy because I hate capitalism and then there I am taking part in it but on the other hand um, 
I think that there's probably some common sense to be had. If I had a short-term rental, which is not in my near future, I would want it to be competitive. I would not want people partying there. I would want um, I would want it to look nice, so it you know drove a higher demand. And I think that that uh, is good for property value. It's maybe not good for property taxes, but you know these are all like parts of a really complicated conversation that I would hope that the commission would be able to see some nuances and make. Um, kind of common sense regulations. I don't need six. I probably don't even need three. Maybe I don't need, maybe one. Actually, one might be plenty um, for me and what my plans later in life are, but thanks. Thank Good evening, Madam Mayor, Vice Mayor, Commissioners, Ted Boyle, North Lawrence Improvement. Uh, you've heard me say before that we're against the uh, non-occupied uh, Airbnbs. Uh, Owner-occupied, uh, yeah, you know, it kind of went kind of 50-50 on that deal. Uh, but anyway, uh, North Lawrence is, you know, we're over 80% owner, uh, homeowners. Uh, we have been 75% or 70% for several years but you know we've had over 150 new homes built in the last 12 years 12 15 years and uh, these people have come to North Lawrence they have uh, found out our secret and uh, it is an investment in North Lawrence uh, and you know we've talked about this Airbnbs and they don't see where that is a benefit to our neighborhood and we are no longer a low mod neighborhood since we've had so many new homes built in our neighborhood we are now a medium income neighborhood which is a good thing plus plus thing uh, except we lost a lot of federal money through that and hopefully it will come back other ways but anyway uh, airbnbs uh, especially unoccupied ones that you don't know who's going to be there from time to time and also parking uh, I was a uh, at a variance appeals board meeting on a house on 5th in Ohio where they wanted uh, the residents wanted the parking to be on the property and the owners didn't want that there and there was four residents from that block against it they wanted the parking to be on the property and the Board of Zoning Appeals said no. And they approved the parking on the street. So, you know, uh, what it does, it, uh, these B&Bs, they, they ruin the aesthetics, the atmosphere of the neighborhood. People move to our neighborhood. Number one reason when we surveyed them is the rural atmosphere. Number two, we got the best school in Lawrence, Kansas. And number three, it's walking distance to downtown. And personally, my house, my wife and I bought it in 1978, completely gutted it. It was built in 1880. And we, uh, first year, put about 30 grand in that and uh, have lived there for over 45 years. And it's a continuing process uh, to better it. So it, it's an investment. And that's the way the houses are in North Lawrence. And to put a motel next to my investment and other individual people's investment uh, should be a criminal act. Uh, we just we just don't want that. And I'll tell you, there was two houses. Thank you, Ted. All right. Yeah. Take care. Hi, I'm Chris Flowers. Um, I was here the night the commission denied the Holiday Drive short-term rental. It seemed kind of BS because that property owner had jumped through all the hoops and then was still denied the permit due to whiny neighbors. So I, th I think this idea seems better, seems like a better plan than the current one because it, it seems like there's more it's more concrete I guess but I, I still kind of have questions um, I was just wondering if there's a limit on the number of short-term rentals allowed on a block or in a neighborhood with this plan like um, 
if there is no limit on the number of short term short term rentals in a neighborhood are we going to end up with blocks comprised mainly of short term rentals because that's the only place in Lawrence without neighbors complaining and so it's basically the only place where they can build so then also um, I just want to say I am I'm okay with some short-term rentals but I think too many could end up being bad for affordable housing and if if we are going to allow them which I'm okay with allowing some but we should do it in a way that it's fair so like the holiday drive person where they're not jumping through hoops just to end up being denied in the end thank you Um, I'm one of the whining neighbors from Holiday Drive. Is this working? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I'm a, my name is David Burroughs. I live at 912 Holiday Drive. Um, I'm an economist. Um, I should declare a possible conflict. I own some rental dwellings that are long term. I don't think that's got much to do with my opinions here. Um, I want to talk about a welfare analysis of uh, short term rentals. Uh, when we say welfare, we mean a couple things. We mean uh, division of the pie and the size of the pie. The uh, size of the pie is a benefit cost analysis. Uh, and it's very easy to do a pretty conclusive benefit cost analysis of an owner non-occupied short-term rental as follows. Um, a short-term rental is a hotel put in a, a small hotel put in a neighborhood. Um, hotels are normally zoned away from neighborhoods because they have lots of externalities, side effects. Um, those include things like traffic, um, attraction of crime, um, sorry, I'm getting a little uh, hypoglycemic. Well, I'll try to continue. Yep. Um, Would you like to pause your time and return to finish it? I'm sorry, what? Would you like to pause your time and return to finish it? I'd, I'd like to come back in a few okay. minutes. You were at about a minute, so you have two minutes remaining. Other public comment? Hello, I'm Angie Blair, 1824 Vermont, and I just wanted to comment about the objection uh, process and comment that uh, I don't know that there's one for long-term rental. I certainly agree. I do have short -term, two short-term rentals, uh, uh, both owner-occupied, uh, because my son lives in my uh, other house. But just wanted to comment that I don't know uh, that even homeowners or anyone else about the objection process. I do agree that anyone should have the uh, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> the right to object, and, <clears throat> and we should be able to uh, object and have privacy and decency to live in our own homes, as we should with any neighbor. So I just wanted to, uh, you know, understand the difference between short-term and long-term rental on any kind of traffic, trash, or all the other things that we want to attribute to short-term rental. Uh, it just feels a bit discriminatory. Thank you. Other public comment? Come on up. Well, I start my time, how do you do this thing? I just want to have this up here and just.
My name is Sherry Ellen Becker. I'm a. Oh, sorry. Okay. My name is Sherry Ellen Becker. I'm another Holiday Drive whiny neighbor. Um, I put a lot, a lot of time into this, and I have a couple just facts I'd like to share. Um, after a lot of deliberation and many public meetings and many work sessions, this is what the city of Fort Collins, Colorado, another college town, not that different from Lawrence if you look at the ratios, has decided to do in their town. The yellow is both um, primary and non-primary are occupied and non-owner occupied. The green is only owner occupied and all the other areas are long-term rentals only. I'd like to read a little statement on the uh, Madison, Wisconsin uh, mayor's site. Websites such as Airbnb and VRBO connect homeowners with people who need a place to stay when they're traveling. Though many homeowners use these platforms for in intermittent on-the-side rentals, some property owners have gone far beyond this modest ideal. In some parts of the country, property owners are using these web web platforms to operate de facto hotels and people are buying property with the sole purpose of using it as a short-term rental. Taken to these more extensive lengths, short-term rentals have a substantial effect on the neighboring property owners, changing the character of a neighborhood and limiting the stock of affordable housing. Madison has enacted ordinances that streak, seek to strike a balance between the competing rights of property owners. Under city, city ordinance, homeowners or renters can own some, earn some extra money renting out space in the dwelling they occupy. But reasonable restrictions ensure that neighbors retain the right to control the type of neighborhood they are living in. You may only rent a property if it is your primary residence. Um, we had the place on Holiday Drive. They started it in late October, early November, and it was zoned PUD, so it's maybe three or four non-related adults living there. There were never, or renting there by the night, there were never just three or four non-related adults or family, unless we're all family here. I stood outside that place once for an hour, and I saw 30 people going in. So it was, and the people stood right here and admitted that they had damage in just that short period of time. It w it's in these single family areas, it is not, does not create a vibrant neighborhood. It's a detriment to the neighborhood. So I think that. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chairman, uh, Mayor, and the rest of the commission, my name is Juanita Carlson. I live at 912 Holiday Drive. Uh, we've been there for 30 some years. Um, my partner, uh, Dr. Burris, will be speaking shortly, but I am in support of the comments that have been made by Ms. Ellenberger and um, Dr. Burris. One thing that if you do go forward with uh, looking, uh, approving this particular ordinance, um, I see nothing, absolutely nothing in there that addresses the Americans with Disabilities Act. I believe that was referenced by myself or perhaps Dr. Burris or uh, Ms. Ellenbarger at the last time we spoke uh, months ago. But uh, hotels must uh, have compliance with uh, the that particular law and um, I would invite the commission to take a, a good look at that in terms of compliance with the Americans with Disabilities Act for whatever version of the, um, if you do pass it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, <clears throat> call it a hotel or don't call it a hotel. It has exactly the same function and it competes with it. 
um, hotels are separated because it's very expensive not to. Uh, there's too many bad things that can happen there, and we control it by putting them on a busy street and requiring parking and making sure there's somebody on site and making sure the police come by every so often to keep things under control. Um, those are called externalities. Um, if you take a hotel and you put it into a neighborhood, you save the cost of all that regulation, but uh, you lose the cost of all those externalities being imposed on the neighbors. And every city in the United States, with a few tiny exceptions, says that the cost of regulations is less than the cost of the externalities, and therefore we heavily regulate hotels. So um, in the particular case of taking an owner non-occupied bed and breakfast, putting into a neighborhood, the benefit cost analysis is perfectly clear you've made the world worse. You've, just, you've made the pie smaller. You should not do that under any circumstances if, if all you care about is uh, total income, total happiness. Now, there could be distribution ratios. I'll come back to that if I get time. Um, the owner-occupied cases is a good bit different because there's an additional welfare consideration, which is uh, you've got some slack capacity in the the house that's not being used, or oh, you have some slack labor that's not being used, you're able to make use of them so you can expand the pie um, in the case of an owner-occupied um, uh, residential um, B and B. Um, now there's also the question of you know, distributional analysis, who wins and who loses. Um, in the case of a owner non-occupied, in the case of a, non a remote owner, um, the, the money that's saved from not having a hotel um, goes to a couple of places. One is it goes to, to the uh, owner, he makes a profit, and uh, partly he probably has to buy some help, and so that'll go some labor, but that labor is essentially offsetting labor that would have been in the hotel, so that doesn't really impact the city. Uh, the other, other place it goes is to uh, the, the new renter, but he's from the outside of the city. And uh, there's already a lot of options for renters in the city of Lawrence, and we're not really f expanding that market all that much. Thank you. I, I guess I'd like to ask a question about the distributional analysis, Dr. Burris. Um, what I'm hearing, I think, is that the externalities are a part of this analysis. Is that Absolutely. Correct? So that the externalities are experienced by the neighbors and they bear that cost, is that correct? Exactly. Okay. And that the benefits are uh, essentially derived by the um, owners and the renters. Exactly. So what you're having is you're having a distributional problem. Not only has, this, has the pie shrunk, is that correct? Exactly. But there's a, there's a skewing of the uh, externalities to these various groups. Right. Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Is there any other general public comment on this topic? I'm Tina Santalaria. I live at 1303 Ranchero Drive. I have short-term properties and long-term properties. I just wanted to say thank you to the City Commission for all the time that you guys have spent on this. I know it's been several years that we've been dissecting this, and really that's my main thing is to thank you. Um, one thing that I'm a little concerned about um, are the multiple properties because I have multiples, um, and I'm hoping that we will continue to only allow uh, Lawrence residents to have, or long-term Lawrence residents to have properties and not bring in um, corporate and um, you know bigger companies to buy a property and, and turn them into um, Airbnbs. But uh, for local residents that really have a vested interest and are good hosts and are good um, uh, people in Lawrence that really, really care about their properties, I think that we can add some value to what we have here. So thank you for all of your work. Thank you. Is there any other general public comment on this issue? 
Okay, we will bring it back up to the commission. Thoughts? A question for Randy. Yes. Does the proposed ordinance limit ownership to longtime Lawrence residents, or is it available to anyone who chooses to buy a property in the city? It's available to anyone who, who can purchase the property within the city. We really, under the privileges, immunities, clauses of the Constitution, would have difficulty limiting it to only residents of Lawrence. So Marriott could buy? Absolutely. Yeah, thanks. But they would still be subject to the same limitations as everybody else under the ordinance, but they would have the same rights as, as everybody else. Other questions? Mayor, in, the, in maybe kind of a similar vein, I'm not sure it would be for Randy, but if you limit it to an owner having three, uh, it seems like there's workarounds with limited liabilities and uh, things like that. Uh, how difficult would it be for staff to make sure that one person didn't have three corporations with different names? And We can track down, I mean, for example, if there's an LLC, we'll look to see who the owner is. That those things are all read. They have, they'll have to be registered with the state before they do that. And we can track it down and, and we could, they can figure out whether or not somebody's just using shells to avoid, you know, the rules and regulations. I mean, is it possible someone could do it in, in a family member's name or something of that nature and get around it? Uh, perhaps, but I think we've had this come up with some other things and we've been fairly successful in, in, in capturing who owns what and who's doing what. Maybe if we're asking Randy questions, um, the um, under the ordinance as is written is if you have to live within 200 feet to have standing to raise an objection. I believe that's within the notice, and yes, that would be the, so would be the case. That would be the standing area. Yes, that's how we've typically treated it. So the notice is the time. same as the standing. Okay. Right. And um, another question here. As you look at the, the the basis for the objections as written, I know it's home and uh, um, quiet enjoyment. Would that standard change as you had, you know, if you had three of them on your block versus one on your block? I mean, is that... It, it would that very well in the cer under certain circumstances. That could be a situation where... You know, someone raised it, and we've already got two or three of those, and it's causing traffic situations, and, and the, I could see how the director could look at that and determine, yes, that is, you're now to the point where it is limiting someone's ability to quietly enjoy the property. And then, you know, of course, there's an appeal process for that to be happened, but that, that, could, that could be one result of that. Okay. Thank you. So I just want to piggyback on um, what Courtney was saying regarding the uh, ownership. When I read the definition of owner and persons in here, um, it indicates that a corporation is a person, um, well as LLCs, partnerships. So if you have four LLCs and you have some of them have common owners but others don't, so if you got three people in one and two, two people in another and six people in one, but you've got potentially one common person throughout them, but maybe not. I mean, how do you deny the ability to have an Airbnb if you don't have the same owners on each partnership or LLC? It, it, it would apply as, let me see how this written. The way it's intended to work is that if, if someone has an ownership interest in, in the property, 
and it's licensed, they would be a licensee within the within that thing. So if they have are members of four LLCs that have it, then that would be the fourth one. Each of the owners of the property, although only one of them may have been issued the license, they would all be considered a licensee, and so that would trigger a, a, a denial. So they would have to change ownership or do something else before it would go. That's the way it's intended to work. Is that the way it's written? That's how I understand it. If you, that's how I understand it. Is that how it's written, though? I mean, do you? Th I, d I just don't see where that's in here. That. Are you talking about the definition of owner? Yeah, I'm just looking at definitions. I, I you know, it might be throughout the document that I'm not s just seeing it. Um, I'm just concerned that the ability to limit it to three rentals that an LLC or corporation or whoever we're calling people these days, um, that it's going to limit um, some work around. As I read it, that's how I still read it. Thirteen A zero three B. It's under the heading of short term rentals permitted limitations. And in that section it, it goes a little further and talks about um, no licensee owner or person shall own own in part or operate more than three short term residential. In our May 19th work session, we asked staff to consider the impacts to affordable housing. Can uh, you please remind me or summarize what you have learned about the impacts to affordable housing? Apologies. We kind of looked at the research to it and just put numbers on paper and it, it's a hard thing to track down because we have so few of these in the market in comparison to the totality of the housing units there. To give you a, a ballpark example, there's about 43,000 housing units in the city of Lawrence presently. These would equate to 100 to 200 of them, so we're talking less than about half a percent of that one. So it's hard to figure out an exact impact or swing in the market that would be tied to them. One thing that we brought up was we brought this to both Planning Commission and the Affordable Housing Advisory Board, and they both kind of came to a very similar conclusion that we just don't have enough data to analyze to kind of get to a, a conclusion to that one. There is a lot of research that's been done out there, both on the academics and those kind of sides of things there. Um, there is, in larger markets, I should point out, not necessarily markets of our size, and when you have them in that larger scale, you do tend to see some shifts and swings depending upon the programs and how they're written and how they're enforced. But it, it's, it'd be hard to kind of say that there's a, a, a clear drawdown to our market or our position based on those different programs. And you know, to to the, to date, the only um, authorized um, operating short-term rentals are those who have the four SUPs and the um, currently licensed owner-occupied. Is that correct? That's correct. So, um, given that we don't have a authorized program, it's possible that there's some demand out there that would come out once we had a program. That could have an impact on affordable housing. That, that could so if you look at other markets where this is further developed, do you see impacts on affordable housing? Off the top of my head, I don't have a lot of numbers in front of me here. I think we'd have to see a pretty substantial swing up in the amount of units that would be going into the short-term market to really start affecting those lines. Okay. I don't know what that number would have to be. Um, my assumption would be it would need to be more than a half percent of the total housing units in the city to kind of really have that that drive to it. But I think it'd be reasonable to say if you hit a certain market point, you would do you would see a swing of that nature. Okay, thank you. Mayor, could I, I'm sorry, Jeff. I'm gonna hassle you in the similar vein. Uh, when you did your research, and I'm sure you did, uh, what was happening in larger cities, as you mentioned, uh, but I do think there's been some reporting, however scientific, I'm not sure about the difference between larger communities and say college communities. Um, 
and I wonder, in, in, in kind of the same line of questioning, would our community be very different than, I would think, Boston, for example? Uh, could you comment on that? Again, I, I understand you don't feel that you have the data, but. It, it's, yeah, it'd be hard to tell on those things. It, you know, college towns, they work in, in, in oscillations of points depending upon what's going on in the communities, or football or a basketball or a graduation event or any, any number of things that have you during the course of an academic year that might swing different ways those things work out there. It would be, I would expect it to be very similar to what you would see in a hotel and motel kind of uptick during certain points in the calendar year, but I, I don't have enough data to probably be able to give you good guidance on that for just us or another college town, to be honest. Were there any uh, similarly sized college towns you looked at or things you saw reported? Just Not in, in studies related to affordable housing. We looked at a lot of college towns in both their programs and the way that they were implementing them and also some of the difficulties that they had seen as part of their process. So we were kind of looking for them in those lines there. Not many of them seem to be tracking in the same, same affordable housing aspects that we were looking for at that moment in time. I will caveat that and say that that research was probably done about uh, 18 months to two years ago at this point in time, so that might have changed depending upon certain schools and programs. Thank you, Jeff. I don't know if this is a question for you, Jeff or Brian, but um, as I read the, the we removed the definition of non-owner-occupied and owner-occupied, right, in this draft? Correct. It was removed from the land development code in, in this proposed text amendment. Okay. So when, if if uh, if I'm applying for this license, do I have to indicate whether or not I'm non-owner occupied or occupied, or can I switch back and forth on that? I might yield to Brian on this one. Okay, <laughs> on that one. But uh, for the land development code perspective, it would not have an effect on that. Yeah, I know it wouldn't have an effect on that, but I guess let Brian. Good question. I think what we would want to do, based on um, question that you had for us, would I think we would identify that. Um, owner occupied versus non on the application. We could do an attribute in our tracking software. We can probably then put that on a map. So the map that I showed you on the presentation, you could probably have it identified by the non owner occupied versus the owner occupied. Um, so I think that's very, that's very doable. Okay. Um, but the, the the way it's way the definitions have been struck struck out. Um, we, we view everything one path of compliance. I think it's important to note as well, previously, or currently right now, an owner-occupied just has to be uh, live there more than one day past half of the year. So you could have an owner right now that's owner-occupied that could be renting their property out for five or six months of the year, depending on their lifestyle, whether they go on vacation during the uh, summer, whether they're a business person and they travel two or three times a, w a month. So, um, so there's that element as well. Um, if I may, though, that's not unusual for some of what other communities are doing, setting time limits for how much time you need to spend in those uh, units, right? There has been other cities that we researched that did that. Um, from an enforcement um, angle, that's, that's, we, we knew that was problematic to begin with, but that's the way we went, so we had to define it. Um, one thing of, of note that I think you might want to know, I, I did look at some statistics for our inspections on short-term rentals since the implementation. I thought you might want to know this. Um, and, I, and this is based by this, this opinion that I might say right now is based on this data. Overall, we are finding, my inspection staff, we're finding that short-term rentals overall tend to be, um, tend to have less violations. Of all the inspections we've done so far, now it's a very small sampling size, 51% of them over half had zero violations. Um, 84% had three or less. Um, so with this, they're different animals. Short term, you get reviews online. That's what, that's what fuels your ability to rent. Um, people look at those pictures. So it looks like what we're finding so far in, in a very small sampling, a little over a year, that those properties tend to be very well maintained. And following up a little bit on that, I think you said earlier that you think, you know, given what's out there now, those may be 110, 120, um, but we know there's at least, what, 48 owner-occupied, and you thought a few more. So are we, th are we thinking more like 60 or 70 owner-occupied and 30 to 40 non-owner-occupied? Is that? Well, we, we, I think we had around 
30 plus, Jeff might correct me if he's still around. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> he ran, he ran. <laughs> he ran. <laughs> um, I think we had about 30 SUPs going through the process, give or take a few, and we, had, we issued the four. So out, out of that 48, I'm guessing we probably, we probably still have around that many non-owner occupied. But what we did to try to track them and not forget them, we put everyone that we found since then in a pending status. We may not have even contacted those people yet. But for our tracking purposes, we thought it was important to provide you this information. Here's how, to, here's how many more we have right now that aren't licensed, that we don't know for sure they're all, we don't know whether they're, how many are non-owner occupied versus owner occupied, but we know that they're being advertised out there at the current time. And when, um, when you inspect, you, you, if, if someone had an owner occupied, short term rental or a non owner occupied, you inspect it the same, you inspect the entire house, right? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, what we were running into, especially on the owner occupied, so people, here's the thing, we, the, the owner may tell us this is where, where they rent, but we never know if they leave town the next week and they rent the whole thing out. So we found to err on the side of caution that we would inspect everything unless the owner was adamant, my bedroom is off limits, never, you know, it's always locked. So we check for smoke detection on each floor because if you are on the second floor of a bedroom, well, smoke detection is really important on the first floor or the, or the basement. Um, and mechanicals are important, carbon monoxide, e egress for windows. So we, we do check um, pretty much the whole unit regardless, especially if it's um, non-owner occupied, but we do our best depending on what we're presented by the owner of an owner occupied. They may be really adamant that my room is never rented, it's locked. And then, you know, depending on how stern they are with the, that <coughs> conviction, we might just say, okay. But for the most part, yes, we inspect the whole unit. Okay, thank you. Since you're there, uh, Maris, okay. Um, I'm, I'm glad you brought up that long-term and short-term are kind of different animals, but one thing that's come up in the past and was also pointed out this evening, um, the short-term rentals could be very well taken care of or that the rules seem stiffer for short-term rentals than long-term rentals. And I know you also work on long-term rentals. To me, it's really a matter of time for us to reassess what we're doing with long-term rentals. And I know you've had a lot of experience with that. Um, and I, I hate to put words in your mouth, but I guess to ask you, uh, to me, all this does is spurn more discussion about long-term rentals instead of scrutinizing more short-term rentals. Um, I think we're going to do that soon. Yes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, and I had talked to you a little bit earlier. I, I, the maps, I know when planning was looking, at, they really enjoyed uh, seeing the maps to give them um, some context, especially with uh, respect to uh, affordable housing, uh, trying to parse that out. And I had asked you, we know what the 63 look like on this map, the ones that are um, approved, but we still have the 48 pending and the 56 inactive, so we don't know what those would look like on a map. And well, I kind of do. Okay, please I, tell me. I couldn't give you a map tonight. <laughs> sure. But I give you the second best thing possible. So I, I ran a spreadsheet of all the 48 that are pending, and um, if my math is accurate with the pretty quick review, <clears throat> um, they're, they're spread out through all the community. 33 are west of Iowa. Excuse me. 15 are west of Iowa. 33 are east of Iowa. 15 appear to be in RS zone districts, single dwelling, tip, your typical detached house. And 33 are in non-RS zoning. Now, with, with, with that being said on those numbers, I can't say those are exactly right because I went through and based on my knowledge of the city, I started writing down whether it was or not, so I might have missed one or two on there, but that gives you a ballpark that it appears of the 48 pinning, the vast majority of them um, you know, are in non-single dwelling districts, commonly referred to as single family. And there's, um, there's apartments, um, some downtown, um, yeah, 
the three, so it, it reflects the map that I, I provided. It's, it's spread out. I just used the Iowa street simply for a, a major street for a, a dividing line. Any other questions? Yeah, but I have one. Under the objections section of the proposed code, talk about the fact that neighbors within 200 feet of the property have a right to object. That's my understanding to the to um, getting a license for that property. Um, it it seems to me, based on reading this, that the only way that they could um, prevail in that situation is if um, the, um, the 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 neighbor who's complaining that they have to have uh, some sort of objection, but it, it doesn't seem as though um, there's any outline as to what that objections can be that would be allow them to prevail. And and it does go on to say that the director it's an administrative process, isn't it? Correct. And so the director has the broad, it said actually says the broad discretion to review these and determine that. So um, how, how would that wor work? I mean, essentially one person will decide whether or not the objection is valid. Well, I, I didn't write that section. Randy did. <laughs> <laughs> how, what, what, the, say there's an objection. The objector would have the burden of proof to establish that either the proposed use poses a, a safety hazard or it would interfere with the substantially interfere with the quiet enjoyment of their property now if the if the director were to believe that the um, uh, the aggrieved party was successful then he would then, then there would be a denial of the application if they if the director believed that the app or the person complaining did not meet his burden then they would grant the license. Either way, the other party would then have an opportunity to appeal that to the Building Code of Board of Appeals, and they would have a hearing. There would be a, a public hearing on that matter. So basically what we're doing is just doing an administrative review of it, and if anybody's agreed from that decision, there would be an appeal to a board where there would be full due process and hearing and everything else, and if someone is still unhappy with that, then they would have the right to take that to district court. So. There would be a, a full-blown hearing eventually. We just thought the administrative review could maybe resolve some not very close cases at the start, and the close cases would end up on appeal. I mean, someone could appeal anything. So I mean, you might have some cases that weren't close, but we thought maybe some of those could be resolved administratively and cut down on the burden on the Building Code of Board of Appeals. In addition to that, Commissioner Larson, I would expect, anticipate staff um, when complaints are received, we would enter what we call a public inquiry into our system to track that address, the date, the, the type of complaint, what our actions were, et cetera. Um, since we've had the ordinance on the books, I can recall two complaints we've had on all STRs. One was about a um, neighbor, the neighbor's trash can was being used for trash across the alley, and the other one was um, Basically, the property was being used, and it wasn't licensed yet. If someone had a, an objection to, you know, it's, those only supposed to be four unrelated people, and they think there's ten people who came in over the weekend, right. how would how would that be investigated? Assuming most of your staff was not working on the weekend, or how Good would you question. do that? Um, to date, we have not had an occupancy complaint occur on the weekend. Now we've had inquiries about the number of people occupying non-licensed. Um, STRs before we got involved. Um, just like any occupancy long term, um, a lot of times, well, that's a permanent um, violation typically during a lease, um, an annual one year lease. Um, if it, worst case, best case scenario, I check my email every day. <laughs> I'm that guy, <laughs> um, even in vacation. Um, worst case scenario, if it was if it was a severe enough allegation, um, if I wasn't busy, I, I could respond to that. Um, I've done that before, um, but most likely we would get that complaint the following Monday, and we would um, we would investigate to the best of our ability. It'd be fact finding. Who's our complaint? What's your proximity? Uh, tell us what what you saw, and then um, 
then build our case and go from there. Um, there's the probation part of it. If we believe, I think we could go for the probation part. If it's a reoccurring problem, uh, we'd look at, um, but those are the type of things that would be reported to us that we could document into our system. And when it came time to renew, and if we got the neighbor across the street, um, well, we have two, com three complaints, two for, from that person and one from them of over occupancy, then we have to take those into consideration. Um, I, I would anticipate that even though it says the director, the director makes the final decision, but he would incorporate obviously input from staff that's dealt with the, with the property, whether you know in some regard to inspections or complaints received or something like that. But it says it doesn't say the director has to consult with anybody. No, it doesn't. Um, I, knowing how our office works, I I I think that would be due diligence. So this puts a significant burden on the neighbors who are just simply trying to live their lives. Because they have to make the complaint, they have to document it, they have to do all these things. And, you know, they just want to enjoy their property. I, under I understand. So it seems like there's just two reasons that they can object to this. One is, it, does it pose a hazard? And the other is, does it impede upon their rights to enjoy their property so um, so if all the neighbors if somebody applies for this rental license and all the neighbors within 200 feet say no we just really don't want this in our neighborhood does that meet one of those criteria I don't think so because we're, we're stating in the ordinance that it's a use by right in all zoning districts so I think it would have to be more than just someone saying uh, we don't like short-term rentals we don't want it therefore we want you to deny. I think there would have to be some, some evidence b based on good proof from, from those complainants that here's why we don't believe it should be um, issued or renewed, not just because we don't like the fact the type of rental unit it is. So the neighborhood essentially loses their voice just from the beginning. Um, I mean, that's what it sounds they like. They get a year. I mean, they get a year. I mean, it's a year, well, but, yeah. but to, they can't have any say in that up front it doesn't sound like well Randy, we, can, we, we can did, you oh go ahead we did throw the this trend well it's no I mean it's very similar to the zoning situation they they can't control what someone rezones or doesn't rezone they have an opportunity to speak and this is what they have in this situation as well well they don't have the opportunity to come before the commission because it's well, decided by the director and they have the, then it goes to the building code board of appeals and then it would go to the district court if you want it to come to you we can make it come to you <laughs> it just sounds like the voice of the neighborhood is not being allowed from the get-go from from the minute they well, I mean, file that's well, there's, there's, a, there's an app right they, I know. they have to give notice I know, right? and that's what's concerned at the time of that they file they have to certify that they have sent out the notice and show the letter that they've given and within a certain period of time, then those persons will have an opportunity to object. So the license is not granted until the objection period is, is already done. If they file an objection, then the, the license is not granted. It goes to a, admit basically a decision before the, the director, and then it, then it could be on an appeal. So there's not going to be any license granted, and they have no say. There, there will be a say before any license is granted, assuming there's an objection. In, in so but the, the two objections, there's only two objections possible where the, those are both extremely very broad yeah yeah um, so if, if the if the property hasn't even started as a short-term rental they get their license um, at that point n no neighborhood neighbor within that 200 feet would have any sort of ability to object is that there no there might be very well there might be topographical there might be the way the neighborhood is arranged there might be parking issues within the neighborhood those are all things that might be either yeah. safety or might impinge upon anybody's ability to safely or quietly enjoy the property I think another example was the number of yeah. STRs on a block for example yes there's, there aren't any rules on that, is there, in here? No, but that could be something that someone could argue would imp impede their quiet enjoyment of their property, even prior to a license being initially. So is that an objection that would... It, perhaps. It, it might very well be. But we don't have any guidelines set out at this time. We, we, if you start making guidelines, then it's, it's, it's sometimes it's I, better... I'm just have, asking if we have... No, I... I it, the opinion it was these were broad enough to encompass all these things that we've discussed right here thanks 
Commissioner Larson, sort of in, in your uh, vein of questioning, the 14 days, um, I know that's kind of standard, but um, that's gonna lead to my next suggestion, which is that we're gonna notify the people within 200 feet, but not necessarily neighborhood organizations. And neighborhood organizations may not meet every 14 days. Um, so I, I just kind of wanted to see what you guys' thoughts were on that. Um, and um, also along your lines, you know, the one that was denied previously under the SUP, um, my, my feeling watching that was that traffic was a main concern. So kind of in your questioning of uh, Randy, would those traffic concerns rise to the same level as that denial of that SUP? Because I felt, for what it's worth, that that was a good decision on the commission's part uh, in that particular case, uh, in that particular geographical area. Can you clarify your second question? Yeah. Do we think what, the way it's laid out here, we would have gotten the same result from that particular property? I think that's the question that we, Randy, that Commissioner Lawson was kind of asking, and Courtney. I mean, what if a new application comes in? Let's use the holiday drive example. A new application, and the neighbors say it's unsafe. We have lots of kids. We have bad parking. We're a single-family resident. There's not very many rentals. We think it's going to hurt our quiet enjoyment and lay out whatever facts they lay out, just like they did when they came in front of this commission. Um, is that something that the director could take into consideration and, and rule against? Absolutely, yes. That's, that's it's written broad enough that that would be the case. And if the director said, uh, no, I don't agree with you, then they would have the opportunity to do exactly what they did you know, before you, the city commission, it just would be before the building code board of appeals. And if they were unhappy with that decision, then they could go to district court. Okay. I, I guess the difference that I see, Brad, is that under this plan, the license is granted by right. That was not the case with the SUP. Okay. And, and the burden of proof is on the neighbors in this setup. So, I mean, I see that as very different than essentially a neutral analysis of the SUP. Now I wasn't here in May when when we <laughs> didn't, didn't we didn't we send it back and say we didn't like the SUP. <laughs> we I mean, denied the SUP. I know, no, but I meant in general. I mean the whole the whole process. We didn't like the SUP either. So we're trying to find a. We've asked the staff to find a balance in between, though, right? Well, I, full disclosure, I voted against the thing. Oh, okay. In May, so. Uh, okay. Good. You know, <laughs> good to know. Leslie and I voted against it. So. Okay. In regard to your question about um, notifying neighborhood associations, um, I want to point out that every neighborhood doesn't have a neighborhood association. It's true, but we do have um, a website that has the registered ones. That's correct. Um, I would hope that if any of those neighbors, or you know, hopefully the individual who owns the home that is proposed to become a short-term rental would also be engaged in that neighborhood enough to have that conversation. Um, I wonder what the implication is, you know, for folks who are within that 200 feet range who don't feel like they need to bring that to the neighborhood association. Is it a matter of letting them know their right to do so? Or is there a right for a neighborhood association to have that information, particularly if they aren't within that 200 foot range as an association? Uh -huh. I think for neighborhoods, I'm speaking very broadly for no one in particular here as a neighbor, just to know that it's around you. So as much to be engaged with your neighbor and keep an eye on them if they have struggles or you want to you know, make sure that everything's going okay when there are visitors there, not necessarily to impede them um, for what that's worth, but just to know. I think that while I'm not opposed to it, like by the very nature of it, I also would say that I would hope that if you were a neighborly neighborhood where you want to keep an eye on one another, you would feel compelled if you receive that 200 foot notice to take that to your neighborhood association. 
um, and engage your neighborhood association in that conversation. And if you don't, maybe that's indicative of the neighborliness not being quite as pervasive <laughs> um, as perceived. I don't know. It's true, um, but I would also point out that in the past, um, people have come here, um, particularly I think there was a woman from New York who had uh, a property here and it was being taken care of by someone close. She didn't know who her neighbors were, uh, wasn't necessarily engaged with what was happening in her neighborhood, but nevertheless was interested in having that investment here. So, you know, is it may create an avenue for her to be engaged with their neighbors that maybe wasn't there if it was no organization. Any other thoughts on that question? I got more. So if we get rid of the SUP, the SUP, if I recall, was about in the $200 range for the application. S wow, thank you. Seven fifty, um, and with this, it's fifty dollars, which is kind of tracks with what's happening with long-term rentals. But staff was also very clear at that time, not necessarily today, that um, the cost of the staff to be keeping track of all of this, we may not even be breaking even. I guess maybe I would wonder about perhaps raising. Uh, if we went with something like this, perhaps raising the fees so that we were recouping a little bit more for staff time. I guess I'm not ready to um, simply tweak the ordinances. I don't support either ordinance number 9737 or 9740. So, you know, you, you all who want to pass it can figure out what you want to do. <laughs> look to me. Since you brought that up, is it because the, the thing I haven't brought up yet, and, and I'm hearing you speak in the past, and I agree with you, my main concern is affordable housing. Is that what you would like to speak about? I have serious concerns about taking the distinction between owner-occupied and non-occupied away in our, in our ordinances. I think that we have a speaker who's an economist who spoke very clearly about how these are two very different things. Okay, and I also have a serious concern about allowing the intrusion of commercial activity by right in our residential neighborhoods. Um, you know, I think there's significant long-term rental in our neighborhoods. That's not something we can really control, I don't think. Maybe we can and we're not doing it, but I see those as residences. They're a business to the owner of the property, but they're home to the people who live in the rental properties. This is a totally different thing. And it's a commercial enterprise that we would be allowing in our neighborhoods. And I was part of the strategic planning process where we said we wanted safe, welcoming neighborhoods. I think you've got to have neighbors that live in your neighbors neighborhoods to have a neighborhood. So we are going so far astray from what I think we should be doing with these ordinances that I will not be able to support them. And in addition to that, we don't know what the effect would be on affordable housing. I'm glad you brought that up because someone else um, who had written to us had brought that up and I hadn't kind of thought of it in that way because I know um, other commissioners um, you know, it's your property, it's your right. But there is a difference, and I, I, I am a property manager for what that's worth. There is a difference between someone who is the same family for a year or two years and different people every week. Um, and some people live in their rental properties for a long, lot longer than two years. I mean, you know, it's home for them. That's, that's, what, we're li that's what we're missing here. And again, along those lines, that's one of my concerns with affordable housing, again, for what that's worth, is that rental housing is affordable housing a lot of times. And, and I'm very, I, I am aware, and thank you to staff for pointing out what a low number this is compared to long-term rental. But I am still concerned that 50 units might suddenly disappear from our affordable housing stock 
when we spend so much time and energy, the community is invested in uh, the Affordable Housing Trust, uh, we've voted to devote tax dollars to affordable housing, and you know, m m what did we maybe add six units this year? Um, and and then suddenly we're going to say maybe not all of them are affordable by those standards, but a significant number of them might be. So it sounds like we have two votes against the commitment. <laughs> I, I really, I really just wanted to hear what commissioners uh, Bowley and Larson thought about those issues, because it didn't. I, I agree, it didn't seem that they were particularly addressed uh, with this new ordinance. Well, I'll, I'll weigh in here at this point. Um, so, as you pointed out, Commissioner Bowley and myself have been through this whole process for the past two or three years, and I tell you, I, I have. Um, gone back and forth on this numerous times in my head as to why it's okay why it's not okay um, and so I've t I've thought about this a lot and as we come here tonight and I've read through the ordinance um, in the discussions I have very significant con significant concerns um, first of all I should point out that the last time we spoke about this last summer I was I voted for the idea of can we limit the number of units per person which I thought was a good idea but the other issues I had and I've kind of talked about them off and on is I this is a, a situation where I think we cross the line between residential and commercial and so I have a real struggle with that that this is a com actually a pure commercial use of a piece of property in a neighborhood itself and so I can't, at this point I really can't get past that part um, and and, and, I, and as I listen to everybody tonight or listen to staff tonight, I'm concerned that, that um, this is a complaint-driven process that where the burden is primarily on the neighbors to have any enforcement done at all. And so I, I'm concerned that the burden is on the neighbors. And I would point out, I agree with um, Commissioner Bowley regarding the safe and welcoming neighborhoods. That was our, one of our main points in our strategic plan. It just seems to me that the potential long-term long -term harm for our neighborhoods just outweighs having this be allowed in our residential neighborhoods. I'm fine with the owner-occupied. I'm fine in commercial districts, if that's, uh, but I just can't take that leap this time. I mean, I, I favor the uh, owner-occupied. We've done that. That's by right, and, and I, I don't see that as being an issue. It's the non-owner-occupied, the commercial, completely commercial that I have a problem with. What about non-occupied in a commercial district? Like the one, didn't, didn't you we approve an SUP in an apartment building downtown? Yeah, I'm fine with. You okay with that? In commercial. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I mean, I think I voted for that SUP. Yeah. Yeah. I remember all my votes. I, 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 I think there was some uh, an audience member that brought up what what other communities were doing, and it seemed like in that map, it was along certain corridors, and maybe for our community in our context, it might not track. Yeah. Uh, specifically the way theirs does, but yeah. could we outline, okay, 23rd Street. Well, you know, ours is New Hampshire, more Vermont. permissive than Fort Collins because we allow non-owner, I mean, we allow owner-occupied by right throughout the, all of the districts. Okay. And they had significant areas that were not, that wasn't even allowed. So that the, 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 the um, white area on the map was residential neighborhoods where owner-occupied wasn't allowed. So... Um, yeah. yeah, the definition of, yeah. So when we're looking at long-term rental, that means a period of time that is equal to or greater than 30 days in length. So in order to have a long-term rental, for which we're not talking about this process, um, you could rent for 31 days at a time. Mm -hmm. By right. Yeah, and that's that's done. I mean, I have a, a a neighbor who's been in the neighborhood. Actually, she just recently moved to Brandon Woods, but she was in the neighborhood for 65 years, and she owned the house next door, and she rented it on a month-to-month -month basis. So I, I I feel hesitant to submit to fears of by one week or two week when we're talking about 
30 days for a long-term rental. Well, I mean, people lived in her house for a longer periods than 30 days. She just rented on a 30-day basis. They might live there for three years, but that's how she rented it. So it wasn't people, a succession of 30-day rentals and people moving in and moving out. But it's, it could be. It could be, but it wasn't. And she lived there for 65 years. She was part of the neighborhood, a major part of our neighborhood. But that's how she did her rental business. So that's one example, but I think that there is the potential based on this, the ordinances that we have now that in order to qualify for a long-term rental, you rent to a succession of folks for 31 days at a time. And... Um, the fears that I'm hearing associated with that would be similar to what I'm hearing for short-term rental. Um, so that's one thing that I'm kind of thinking about as I process all of this information. Um, the second is that most policy issues are complaint-driven, um, such as sidewalks, such as rental complaints, such as crimes. Um, no one's going to call on themselves and report. Um, that's how that process works. As someone who is in compliance, um, I do have to take all of the information. I have to be a neutral and unbiased fact finder and look at whether beyond a preponderance of the evidence, um, our policy has been violated and make a decision based on that. I make a recommendation and then that final decision is made. I don't, I don't see that staff could be incapable of doing that. Um, I don't see them having a stake in the game um, in making that decision, I think that they can be neutral and biased and unbiased in having that, that conversation. I think when we're talking about the impact on affordable housing, um, we also have options um, like limiting the number in our residential districts of licenses full stop that we submit or permit, um, you know, and making sure that we don't go beyond that. Um, I also want to think about it from the perspective of the users of those facilities having um, parents or a family or traveling with children um, to be able to afford a hotel might not be reasonable or the privacy needed because of disabilities or mental health issues or you know whatever um, occupying an entire home for a weekend might be different from occupying um, a hotel room for a whole weekend. If you have dietary needs, et cetera, like those things can be really difficult to access when you're staying in a hotel. Um, and that can, that can also provide some affordability in that space as well. So to me, it's not cut and dry, it's not black and white. I think that there are a lot of considerations and I think that sometimes we let our fear of potential prevent us from trying something potentially audacious when there are safeguards that we can put in place from the front um, that would protect that or at the moment that we see that issue coming to light and becoming a reality, we're able to insert that as well. This isn't carved in stone. Um, I mean, it goes through a process to be changed, but it is modifiable. With regard to your comments about the complaint-driven nature of this and its replication in our other areas like sidewalks and, and uh, other areas, code enforcement, that may be one of the weaknesses that we have in our regulatory framework. And I think we really need to, to say as we do something new, do we want to simply replicate the weaknesses that we have in our other regulatory frameworks? Or as uh, Commissioner Shipley suggested, maybe we need to take a look at the other regulatory frameworks. So can, can you give some examples? And I'm totally open to that. Um, Long-term rental registration. So tell me, tell me about how that is. And is it then the burden is on the person applying for it to prove that they won't impact those things? No, uh, the question is, what's the role of city staff in doing more rigorous enforcement, or do we simply wait for the complaints to come in and then go figure them out? Well, sidewalks. Sidewalks, same way, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I'm just, I'm not saying we should do something different. What I'm saying is, we have an opportunity to set this up from the beginning. Do we want to replicate what may be weaknesses in our other programs as we do that? And my inclination is to simply do the best we can with what we are faced with right now and then ask questions about what else we're doing. Randy, were you going to add something on that? 
Maybe not. Am I putting you on the spot? I'm sorry. I didn't have anything. <laughs> I mean, you know, under the long-term code, there was inspections. This is set up almost identical to that, and most of the things are going to be complaint-based in that situation as well. Whether it's too many people living in, in a house or whether a tenant complains that the, the water heater doesn't work, whatever. Are there other models um, where that burden is placed on the applicant? I mean, I just, I, I imagine they would definitely be biased. Um, on the applicant for? To prove that they won't impact quiet enjoyment or health we don't like to do that because it puts our officers into a discretionary function. We prefer it to be ministerial. So, you know, certain things, they get the license. And we don't typically do that with the you know, city clerk. Most licenses, there's one, two, three, you meet them, you get the license. Otherwise, you, you don't get the license. And that's how it's set up here. I mean, they have an application process where they have, would have to go through if, if you did this, where they'd have to meet the certain thresholds or they're going to get denied at the outset. But then there's this extra objection thing that allows neighbors to object to it. But that's pretty much how all licenses and regulations work within the city. They're ministerial as opposed to discretionary. So if we then had, like, you know, city staff who are the rental czars <laughs> proactively inspecting, and I'm sorry, that's just a flippant term that I think other cities are using for those kind of inspectors, um, who were going out and doing that, I mean, I, I can see difficulty even in that, if they were taking, you know, X section each period, um, I imagine there's probably some right to being aware of when that would occur. Um, and, you know, uh, that one weekend when that particularly raucous event occurs um, that would lead to a pretty serious quiet enjoyment complaint would be, I mean, it would, it would be highly unlikely that those would occur simultaneously. So I'm just I'm just curious like what those other models might look like um, without being you know having to hire ten new staff to go out and do that on the daily honestly um, yeah right the rationale behind most of our cases being complaint driven is that we don't have staff to patrol the city and do those types of inspections all the time we don't have the personnel or the financial resources to accomplish that so. We try to do the best we can with on the complaint basis. And so that's the externality that lands upon the neighbors who are simply just trying to live their lives and not but, worry about it. But it falls on them no matter what, right? Like no matter who their neighbor is or what that looks like. That's kind of my, my thought on that is if you have a bad renter or you have a bad property owner, yeah. you're, you're experiencing the same thing. Well, you know, we're living in a single family zone neighborhood that's 55 percent rental mostly student rental uh, you know when someone parks in front of my mailbox and i don't get my mail you know i can go visit with them and and with a short-term rental i might be having that conversation every week instead of having one conversation and and getting it taken care of i mean i mean that's the externalities are magnified, as, as Dr. Burris pointed out, for the people who live in, 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 in the proximity of these things. So I, I think the economic analysis hasn't actually been addressed by anybody up here. You know, when you talk about it's more affordable, it's because, as Dr. Burris pointed out, the externalities are being is placed on the neighbors the regulation that we do for our hotels because of the nature of the business is not being done here that's why it's more affordable the commercial taxes that the hotels are paying that 25 percent assessment is 11 and a half for the residential properties and so you know we did this analysis earlier you know in the year where we looked at the property tax paid by hampton inn on sixth street and property taxes paid by three or four rental uh, STR applicants. The property taxes paid for put a foot of street frontage by the Hampton Inn was five times what it was for the STRs. Does that cover by room? It's by prop. It's the the property taxes paid per foot of street. 
it because there's a concentrated activity because the property value is higher and because it's assessed at more than double what the other properties are so when we have trouble paying for streets are we do we really want to deconcentrate something and have greater burden on and less revenue to to take it in so i mean this economic analysis i'm not really good at i'm glad dr burris is here but simply five times more property tax per foot of street is a big deal i'm no economist but i would also say if there are 300 rooms in a building versus three bedrooms in a building that ratio i would hope would be far more equivalent and hang on um additionally the care and service given to that space theoretically is also higher than that which is more dispersed within that hospital or that sorry hotel space um, so that there is more care and attention particularly because of the high standards associated with renting those spaces out versus a hotel room you get what you get right um, so I just I don't think that it considers all the factors and again I'm not an economist I don't pretend yeah. to be an economist but I think that there are factors that were left out of that I'm not trying to agree with you, but I'm gonna for a second. Uh, one of the <laughs> one of the uh, one of the uh, correspondents that we got um, did point out something that in all of these meetings I had not considered. And again, I'm also a property manager, and yet she pointed this out, and I was like, yeah, duh. Um, if you're running a uh, short-term rental as opposed to a long-term rental, you're paying for water, lights, and gas, trash, which um, if it was long term normally, not always, would be on the renter. So just wanted to point that out to, to your point. Brad, we've talked over you a whole lot. Say something. Well, I, I, I'm kind of a, uh, I'm a little, I guess, pragmatic here. I'm trying, I'm trying to figure out where we have three votes. I mean, um, I think I was trying to draw a, a kind of a decision tree, right? I mean, I think I think there's there's support for for owner occupied yeah. short term rentals, no problem there, right? Okay, so now we're talking about non owner occupied, non owner occupied in commercial industrial districts, downtown apartment buildings. Do we have? I mean. Is that, or do we have, at least three of us are okay with that? Uh, a short-term rental, we had a letter from someone who rents a short-term rental above his business, downtown Lawrence. Is that, are we okay with that either by license, like the non-unoccupied? I'm a little worried about concentrations. In theory, I like it, but, um, you know, I'm, if you have um, you know a whole section of apartment buildings that goes SDR, then what's the impact on affordable housing? So, I mean, I'm you know I'd like to investigate that more, but um, okay. I'm not categorically opposed to that as I am in the in the residential. Would that work for you if you kept the three units by an owner? I I don't see that as limiting the volume. It just limits the volume by for an individual. So then we, so that that's one decision tree. Then I think you get to, in, you know, in a neighborhood, and your options would either be not to allow them at all, to allow them with a license, or to allow them with an SUP. And I am not sure, I mean, I'm trying to figure out if we will, at, I mean, one of the things about the SUP that we learned as we were doing this is that an SUP goes with the property; it doesn't stay with the owner. Exactly. So once an SUP is attached to a property, it's there until it's revoked for some reason mm -hmm. or it just continues on. So I was very concerned about the SUP process once we got into it. And I agree. I didn't period. like. I didn't like the SUP process. Yeah, I mean, that, uh, that was that, one of the reasons yeah. we. Yeah. So I mean. Uh, I, I really didn't like the SUP process for that, so, yeah. So as I said, I'm okay with the um, owner-occupied as well as the commercial. Okay. 
And so then I think you'll, you, you know, again, a possibility is residential neighborhoods having a licensing scheme that either, assuming we don't want to come, you know, there's not th three votes not to allow them at all, a licensing scheme in which, you know, looks more like an SUP, but it's not, you know, it either, you know, it could be, I mean, I could see how you could have the first level be at the director level and the second be the appeal to us. <coughs> Um, would be a possibility. Um, you know, I think there's ways to look at that. I mean, I, I what you ask for, uh -huh. I know. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm just saying. I mean, the other option is to say, you know, or to trust the staff to to have the the process that we have here, and and then go through. I mean, you know, th there's things I think we could do to to tweak this ordinance if we liked it, but I know you don't I'm, like it at all. I don't well, think I mean, Courtney yeah. does. I don't think Lisa does. So I'm trying to think of I, I how we get there. I, 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 I think I, we I should exclude hear from you guys. certain areas from the non-occupied. I would want to be real careful about exclude, that. Yeah. Just because of, you know. I want to do why, it very carefully. Why three <laughs> times um, when we have that conversation? You know, who are we protecting? Who are we keeping out? Who are we inviting in? Um, I think those are really important questions. I think it's commercial intrusion into the neighborhoods, Jennifer. It's not who, it's the commercial activity. It then, doesn't belong in a residential neighborhood. Then you're saying no residential neighborhoods. That's different from some residential neighborhoods. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty much saying I don't like it in residential. No, no, I mean, occupied is fine. Yeah, yeah, and and so I mean the question is what's the character that of the 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 zoning of the area that we're talking about? If it's a commercial district, it's a commercial activity, fine. But you know, residential, not so much. Well, we have some options, right? <laughs> we can make a motion right now, <laughs> and uh, and and move forward. Um, based on what we have before us. I think that if we want to talk about tweaking this so that we can reach, if we're not, if we're not hearing a three, and I'm not hearing not a three or a three, <laughs> um, then we need to give staff some pretty clear consensus-based direction. Um, I think we've all made relatively clear, except maybe Brad, You've, you've been the moderator here. Um, what would get this moving for you, um, if there is any room for that? But I, I do think that we've spent a lot of time yeah. chatting about this, which is important. Um, but let's think about next steps. Can we have a vote on the ordinances just to see where people are? A formal? Yeah, I mean, you know, we can see the move that we have adoption and we'll see what the votes are. If it does fail, can we continue a conversation? About <laughs> it? Sure. Yeah, I guess that was my, one of my questions. If it fails, where are we? Don't we have some ordinances on the book that we would what? Right. Those would those ordinances would still be in effect. So then, perhaps then we could get direction as to what it is that you'd want to do to replace what we have currently. But right now we're not accepting, for example, SUP applications, so are we? We are not currently doing that based upon um, the direction that were made at the last meeting that okay. this was discussed. So that would remain on the books? Yes. But and if you are non-unoccupied, you could still come get a license? Yeah. I mean, if you, excuse me, if you're non-occupied, you, are those still being processed? Yeah, those are. I'm sorry, what was the question? Unoccupied licenses still being processed owner occupied licenses are still being processed at this point we are we are at a standstill on non owner non -owner. occupied mm -hmm. um, we do have a lot of people that we field questions from yeah so do you want to go ahead and do a motion so may I have a motion Well, I, I mean, I, well, <laughs> I think there could be some work done on this ordinance to make me more comfortable with it. Um, so if the vote is yes or no on this particular ordinance exactly as it's written now, I'd probably vote no on it. But. That's not the same thing as thinking, I think what, you know, I mean, I think, Stuart, you'd be voting no against it for a whole different reason than me, <laughs> talk about I guess. Your, talk about your reasons, can you? Or are you willing to do so? 
Well, I think you could, um, I, I mean, there's a few parts I think you could tweak. I'm not sure I, um, I, I think you could change some of the, the language and the objection section. I think you could, um, you know, change, maybe consider changing the process if that was something that was a concern um, on how the objection happens. You know, I do think it's interesting that right now under the code, owner occupied is by right with license. If we pass this and owner occupied, their neighbor could object to the owner occupied because they're all treated the same. So that seems to be an interesting step backwards if on, on owner occupied short term rentals. Right now, they're allowed by right with no objection. This would create a whole new process for that. Now, maybe no one would object to an owner occupied one, but um, so I think there's some things like that. I'd be interested maybe saying only non, only non, no, no. I, I would like to separate those two. I'd like, I think there's a distinction. I think you could also separate by location. I think you could maybe allow certain objections to owner occupied and non-owner occupied differently. So I think there's some ways to do that, um, y you know, but that's more t tweaking what's in here. Yeah. So is that, um, just to get a clarification, so th this ordinance applies to both owner-occupied as well as non-owner-occupied? Yes. The, the, it so was it, puts, it, was it does that put everybody, every aspect into one bucket. Right, and, and it was and my it, understanding that the direction was the last meeting to eliminate the distinction. I mean, obviously the commission has now changed, but. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Fred, does it impact your thoughts on that, saying that, you know, five months and 30 days out of the year, it could be essentially non owner occupied, even if though it's considered owner occupied? Well, I, I mean, I'll tell you, I've thought about a third category, you know, I mean, a third category of, I mean, lots of cities, as we talked about, have a different category. And I know Brian says the enforcement is difficult, but, you know, there is some cities that have the third category, which is I'm gone for two months. I just rented those two months, but it's my primary residence. That, I mean, I understand why the distinction's there. Is that my primary res residence 10 months out of the year? I leave for two months. I rent it out. Am I non-owner-occupied or am I owner-occupied? It's, it's my understanding that Fort Collins has a different standard than yeah. six months in a day. It's more like nine months. Yeah. So even if so, I mean, we could change that too. I mean, if we start tweaking things, I guess my question is: Do you want to maintain the distinction between owner-occupied and non-owner-occupied, or do you want to eliminate it? That's one of the basic questions I think we have to answer tonight. Well, I think there's a distinction here too, which is if they rent it to the same person for more than 31 days, it's a long-term rental. That's true. Yep. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah. In which case, they're they're getting their occupancy under the wrong license right. because it is it. a long-term rental yep. um, and so are we talking more about the format in which they shop that mm -hmm. which it sounds like we are in this instance yeah. it, well and I think the other category which I've also seen is how many days you rent it in a year so you know one of the other models is I live in my house I mean the, the you know the um, um, college world series model where you you live in Omaha, and you live in your house, but for three weeks every year you move out and you rent it out for three weeks because you can get a lot of money for someone to rent your house next to the stadium. Um, I mean, so the, the all, I mean, there is a distinction, could be a distinction with it's my primary residence, but I'm going to, I'm going to go live with my, you know, I'm going to go visit my brother every football weekend and on each football weekend, I'll rent out my my house. It's an owner occupied, but it, when I'm but I'm not occupying it when it is rented. And that's a distinction some cities make that it's not you don't define owner occupants by the primary residence. You define it by if you're present when the when the guests are there. So that's a slightly different strategy. Um, and so again, there's a lot of nuance to it that you could you could noodle your way through there um, and make it very difficult on Brian to do his job. <laughs> but um, but I think there's a couple models there that you could you could talk about. Um. 
Yeah, none of this defines that. And I agree, I would agree that they are owner-occupied. If that's your primary residence and you rent it out for however long. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so again, I, I, I like... I think there should be a distinction between owner-occupied and non-owner-occupied. I think there should be a di distinction between um, h how you treat owner-occupied, how you treat non-owner-occupied in commercial and industrial districts. And I like the idea of having a licensing program instead of an SUP for neighborhoods. Yeah. I, I don't mean, want to do the SUP. Yeah. And so, um, nope. I mean, I could, I could see that 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 structure so store is that still a non-starter for you um i want to you know maintain the distinction between owner occupied and non-owner occupied i'm willing to have a conversations about how do we define owner occupied okay but again we've got these ordinance here who who you know, which are going in a direction that i can't accept so i mean i think we need to I don't think we can create the framework by tweaking these ordinances this evening. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we need to have a vote on this issue that's been pre presented to us and then provide the direction that we want to see. So I would move that we do not adopt ordinance number 9737 and that we do not adopt ordinance number 9740 on first reading. A second. Motion from Commissioner Bowley, second by Commissioner Larson. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. So at this point then. What was the vote? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. It was unanimous. Yeah. Aye. What did you? <laughs> what was the vote? 5-0. 5-0. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, Unless I missed a whole bunch okay. of days. I, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't hear any. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't hear um, any on that side. So at this point... What are we sending back to staff? <laughs> I'm hearing some willingness to have conversation. Yes. Um, okay. Yeah. I don't know that you would necessarily feel like you have sufficient direction <laughs> at this moment. I don't exactly know where to go. I mean, uh -huh. this one is no good. <laughs> so I, okay, let's let's take some singular points and see if we have some agreement. Um, one of your one of your statements was um, distinctions between zoning districts and non-owner occupied regulations. Does that sound accurate? Well, let me. Can can I please? Um, so start back. I think trying to give direction. Start back on the decision tree of. Do we like what we have now on owner occupied, licensed, yes. no objection period, distinction, fine. Yes. Yes. Okay. So we're okay there. Um, that's what we have currently. And that's what we have currently. We're okay with that. Mm -hmm. Now, um, you know. So then the question is non-owner occupied. Non-owner occupied in commercial, industrial. Jeff, am I missing any other commercial type districts? Commercial, industrial. Can we just say non-residential? Non-residential. I know PUD and yeah. some of the stuff gets confusing, so. The only one that I'd probably call out as a mixed-use zoning district that would be MU would be one to, to categorize and also RSO, RMO, which don't typically fall under your RS or your RM zoning districts. That'd be the, the two differences I'd say probably key on that one. Okay. So commercial, industrial, we're okay with. Can we keep it simple? Yep. Yep. Residential, non-residential, that includes mixed use. Okay. Well, but I mean RSO. Yeah, RSO is residential. You what is RSO, Jeff? Res it's residential single-family office use is RSO. And to kind of give you a differential, 2402 and 2403 are our two use tables that we have in the Land Development Code. 402 is your residential kind of uses and capacity zoning districts. The other one is your non-residential districts, which is 403. But to give you an idea, RM and RS are in the same table under 402. Uh, RSO and RM are also in that table. But then mixed use, commercial, your industrial, GPI, hospital, and open space zonings fall under 403. Okay, so 403 versus 402. <laughs> We're okay with 403. Except for open space. <laughs> Except for open space. <laughs> <laughs> and so not so would you be okay with 
non-owner occupied in these four three districts by license with no objection the, the, this is the commercial all the yes time. yeah yeah I don't, I don't yeah. Have. Mm -hmm. okay so then that leaves and that would be a similar situation but we have for owner occupied it would just be licensed with right right, right. yes yeah because that's commercial essentially in here yeah. as long as it is mm -hmm. narrowed down to that commercial. okay and I'm sure we'll see this again. <laughs> We're not drafting it on the fly. So then, so these these uh, O2 districts, I we agree no SUP. Right. Mm -hmm. So then licensing. Mm -hmm. Do we like licensing with the first step of? Well, except for that, we don't want to allow the commercial intrusion into the residential neighborhood. Okay, so you're against any license, and you, no, you're, I, mean, you I, okay. I don't want the commercial use okay. in the neighborhoods. Okay, so you, and so that so then I think that's our our direction here. Do well, I don't know that we have three people. That's what I'm saying. That. That's what I'm saying. Do we have three people who don't want to look at anything in those districts? Yeah, and I hate yes. to point this out. Sorry, but I have some recollection that in the new comprehensive plan in 2040, one of the things we want to encourage somehow, although we haven't started, is um, businesses in the home, which I just, sorry, Stuart, was afraid would conflict with businesses in the home, which I was just afraid well, I mean, would that, conflict. We with have businesses in the home now. We have we have that allowed by right in certain, I mean, and that's what the owner-occupied is. It, it, it's not the same thing as the business in the home. Non-occupied. I mean, home occupation is, is in our code. Yeah. Okay, but commercial, exclusive commercial use is not. That's that, that's the distinction that I'm trying to draw. Okay. okay. Businesses and homes. So, so I, I would support some sort of licensing scheme in the residential neighborhoods. Stuart would not. Right. Yeah, the, I won't. You will not. Not even if it comes to planning or if it comes to us. No. Okay. So I would. You would? Yes. So two would, two wouldn't. What yeah. would to you? Would the parameters look similar to what they just gave us here? And as much as that's a possibility, I uh, I would think some licensing. I mean, I would support some licensing scheme similar to what we have here. I, I mean, I think we could tweak it. Just some. not SUP. Not an SUP. I don't think an SUP is the right because right. a similar non-SUP process. Yeah. And in that, and I, just to clarify, and also to agree with Commissioner Larson with her concerns about um, how it seemed in, in that particular iteration that the neighbors didn't have as much agency. Um, and in this scenario, uh, again, being more similar to the SUP, um, uh, but not SUP, that had a lot more uh, agency, it seemed like, up front for uh, uh, neighbors and people who lived there. Does that sound like what you guys are? Yeah, I mean, I, I could see a licensing program that, you know, give the give the staff the first, and then the appeal to us instead of the appeal to the board. You know, to the I board. I will point out that Brad has not experienced one of those. <laughs> I'm sorry, um, I, I did not. not. That I don't volume. think yeah, that we're. I'm just yeah, saying, without support, support you'd still need to get three other votes. I'm just saying, um, I, I mean, I, I think there's a process in which, I mean, I, I, I think there's scenarios in which short term rentals in certain neighborhoods in certain places could work, do work. I've seen them work. I don't think they all destroy the neighborhood. So I, I think there's a p p process in which we could make that work as opposed to just banning them outright. Yeah. And again, how we get there, I think, would be, um, you know, I, I can see why why the neighbors, you'd want to have some um, upfront discussion about that. So, I mean, you know, neighborhoods are, I mean, there's a lot of neighborhoods that are completely different. I mean, just to say residential, again, you could be residential and have some non-conforming uses all around it, and this could be right next door to a bar, you know, and it was a long-term rental, and the people in the neighborhood would rather have, the, you know, have it than not. I mean, I mean, you, you could have all sorts of scenarios in which I, I think you could see these work in residential neighborhoods. I can see situations where they wouldn't work in residential neighborhoods. So I support some sort of process to get us there. And I want to I make a slightly more cogent argument about not bringing it to the city commission, yeah. other than they're difficult, <laughs> because that is our job. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just clarify that. Um, but I also think that it's not our job. 
because we are tasked with looking at the long-term vision for our community and engaging in policy governance, where it is our job to talk about the process for this, but when we're making specific decisions at specific times and locations, yes, there are times for that, and I'm not denying that, but we really have to take that long view, that big picture look, um, and I think that there would be boards that are more appropriate for looking at that very um, micro application of a policy that we've spent a lot of time in consideration developing factors for them to consider yeah. uh, that's a good uh, argument yeah I, I would just I would just add when you talk about long-term vision that's, um, that's you know how we look at things or we we need to look at things as a long term and I Brad you'd indicated that you don't feel as though the Airbnbs have destroyed or hurt neighborhoods we don't even know this is a whole new business model yeah we have not, I don't think, have had enough experience long term to know the full potential impact. But I, I'm just concerned, you know, you've heard my concern. Oh, yeah. Commissioner Shipley brought up Plan 2040. I mean, what we're talking about is increasing the, the density and the uses of our, of our current footprint. And with, with this activity, what you're doing is you're going exactly the opposite direction on that. You're taking an activity that's currently concentrated in the hotels and you're dispersing it into the neighborhoods yeah. so we're going exactly the opposite of intensifying the de the, the 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 density and the utilization of our current footprint and that will put pressure on expansion and all of the financial and environmental costs to go along with that i mean when you take a look at the big picture which is what we're charged with this is going in the wrong direction I would agree with that if we saw a rapid or a gross influx of the number of Airbnbs that are being offered. And I'm sorry for using that corporate app name for it because that's oh, yeah. short term rentals. Um, and I think that we, far be it from me from making a market analysis. <laughs> But there is a tipping point, right, at which it is not profitable. If you're paying the utilities um, and you're offering a space that isn't being utilized to maintain that as a short-term rental, um, there will be some correction. And again, if I saw 5% even of our housing stock being used for that purpose, that would be cause for concern. But we're not seeing that. And how do you address that once it's happened? I think that I, I mentioned that, putting a cap on the number that can be in residential districts total, um, putting a cap on reducing the number that an individual can own, um, et cetera. I think that there are ways to do that. So not to get away from where we were, which was maybe thinking, keeping on a track, but you didn't want them to come to this board, but perhaps another board. So then I guess my question, I do want to come back to what Stuart was saying, but Randy, could it only come to us? Could it go to planning? Is the board that you were sending it to here, um, rather than going administratively or doing both? The Building Code Board of Appeals would be the appropriate place, not the Planning Commission or the BZA. Um, we have been moving, you know, back in the time when city was smaller the governing body handled a lot more of these types of appeals from things as we've been edit changing and amending the code we've been moving a lot of the appeals away from you so that it frees up your agendas just to give you a heads up on this this is so we specifically you know the SUP had to come to you because of the statutes and state law but once we got into a licensing situation, we don't typically bring licensing appeals to this board. We, we'd send them to the Building Code Board of Appeals or, you know, the electric, you know, whatever. The other, there's other boards that we have that hear these types of appeals. And then the appeal from that would be to the district court. We always put in there that's whatever that board decides is the final decision of the city, and then it can be appealed to district court. So that's not the end all and be all. Okay, you guys convinced me on that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so some sort of, uh, again, I, I would think there's some sort of licensing scheme we could come up with. I don't know if we can come up with it up here right uh, now. But again, to go back to your point, since we kind of agree on that a little bit, um, capping the number in a neighborhood, which was very difficult in your conversations before, but you did bring it up a moment ago. Um, in the neighborhood or in the city? Or? Yeah, I think it would have to be citywide, not oh, okay. neighborhood. Sorry, I misspoke. Sorry. 
No, I how, I probably did say neighborhood. You but did we didn't. But we haven't talked about that here. Is there some little bit of discussion we could have about that in terms of giving them direction? Or do you, are you more interested in the line we're going on right now? I mean, we could even look at, you know, is it X percent of available rental property is used for, is the cap for, or the X percent of licenses for any kind of rental can be dedicated to, I don't know. That, does that though come down to first come first serve? Most likely. That, that's where it gets problematic, it seems yeah. like. But Randy, I don't want <laughs> to. To be honest, we've, we had all these, we pretty okay. much had these, and we went away from a number base other than capping in individuals because it's, it basically it was going to be a logistical nightmare for the, the, the development or the sure. code enforcement people. I mean, I suppose you could cap a number, but we'd have to do some research, of, you know, citywide, but we'd have to do a research. And, but it would then become like a, Oklahoma gold rush, you know, for the land to get, see who can get those licenses first. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you <laughs> are liquor licenses similar? Aren't there a specific number of those? Are there any other licenses that are num um, limited by number? No, we, we don't limit any licenses by numbers. We, t you know, typically allow the market to play itself out. Some of those are commercial licenses, and, you know, the, 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 the market system usually works. If there's too many of them, then some of them will start falling away because they can't, they can, you know, the economy can't support all of them so we typically don't do that and we don't have any licenses that are capped by now okay. at this point okay i tried i know <laughs> <laughs> so would you support some sending this them back for I would, some with very specific could, direction it's not prohibited you could choose but it would be should do some research to determine where that number right. should be and you would have again perhaps first come first serve situation so that's just was there another community that did that and they didn't other than the amount of time and injury it took it didn't wasn't legally problematic for them i'm not, i i'm not aware of any okay. that might be something to some in a place far far away I, some far far away there's <laughs> such schemes and regulatory um, confines where you you kind of try to make it so that the density didn't occur and you you structured it so that there are only so many in a certain density um, but it was far far away from here <laughs> <laughs> there, there was a couple communities that we looked at that had some kind of iterations of that um, one comes to mind I think they're on their fifth version of the program now I don't think that version <laughs> is stuck um, so there's been two. a lot We're of different trial third. and error so uh, it's it's out there but you kind of see places going many different directions there's not really just one angle that a lot of them are taking to at the moment so i think looking into that might be worthwhile at least to understand what the options might be well can we send them both those things this i think what we have is some kind of accord on a licensing scheme that would give again more agency to uh neighbors and neighborhoods and what was here that we denied, um, but also asked them to look at um, staff, sorry, staff to look at uh, a capping scheme that would be allowable or practical. Now, would you want that capping scheme to just apply to non-owner occupied or to all of them? Non-owner occupied and residential. And to clarify, would you still want the limit on the owner how many an owner can have yes yes so you commission also I want you to look at the language <laughs> one more time <laughs> maybe Randy will look at that language one more one time more before time. it comes back <laughs> see if it yeah. meets what we want there yeah, yeah. Are there so, any other? Yeah, oh, please. So we talked about owner-occupied was fine, but we didn't define what owner-occupied means. Do we need to do that? I thought there was some yeah. had concerns yeah. about is it for two weeks, 31 I'm days? I'm not concerned about it. I was just pointing out yeah. the distinction of if they're renting it for 31 days, then it's a long-term rental. But it's also owner-occupied, so owner, yeah, that's not for me. So do so do is that something we need to talk about? What does owner-occupied actually mean? I think that we have they a definition. it has what, a definition yeah, now. The, the, like a, what, what? Okay. Is there a definition I'm, for well, occupied? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the current one is, I believe it's six months and one day or something of that. Okay, so, so we have. Well, just one more yeah, then half fine. the year. That's good. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. 
Are, okay. you, are you happy with that? Yeah, I'm fine with that. Okay. Are there any other issues that we want to send back to staff or we feel like that is that does that feel directive enough? Yes, I believe we have direction. Okay. Are we ready to move on? I'm, I was, I'm gonna ask the same thing I always Please, ask. Yeah. How long will it take you to bring that? <laughs> After we kicked it to you three times. Um Probably not till early April at the earliest. Is that too late? I'm going to be gone in early March and then have a hearing. And then after that, I should have some freedom and free time and or not free time, but I'll, <laughs> I could move things aside in March if that's all right. Does that seem reasonable? The, we do have one slight comp complication is that a portion of this will need to go to planning commission first. Ooh, which mm -hmm. new one? Depending yeah. on if there are changes given the direction tonight okay to the chapter 20 piece um if it would have to go to planning commission at this point the next available agenda that staff could probably hit would be may or june oh so we'll have to look we'll have to take a look at some timing we will certainly get on this as soon as possible thank you and thank you for letting us know yeah Part of it will, part of the, our research and how we get through this, that'll determine if there are changes to the decision that the Planning Commission already made in looking at the changes to the Chapter 20. So. Because they wouldn't look at the licensing, they just look at the Chapter 20 change. Correct, but some of these changes may, right. are probably going to impact what has already been to the Planning Commission. Yeah. Okay. So we'll have to look and see the level of those changes. Okay. Um, so let's take a 10 minute break and then we'll move on to item two on the agenda. <laughs> item two. <laughs> <laughs>
second section session and we are moving on to item two on our agenda which is consider adopting on first reading ordinance number 9744 which establishes municipal and community-wide goals to achieve 100 percent renewable energy jasmine okay hello Good evening, uh, Mayor and Commissioners. I'm Jasmine Moore, Sustainability Director for the City of Lawrence. Um, so what I'm going to do today uh, is just give you a summary, a review of how uh, we got to this point, um, because you've received a presentation on this topic before. So um, the Sustainability Advisory Board identified 100% renewable energy as a policy goal uh, in late spring of 2019. And uh, as a result of that, there was a subcommittee formed uh, from that group, which researched um, other municipalities. Uh, there's been over 100 and, uh, well, 159 uh, cities that have commitments similar to this in the United States. And this committee um, looked specifically at 18 municipalities in the Midwest area uh, in states that are almost touching um, uh, Kansas. Uh, the subcommittee developed a white paper which included research and recommendations and that was included in your agenda packet. Uh, in November, um, that subcommittee presented their findings to the Sustainability Advisory Board and at that meeting in November of 2019, the Sustainability Advisory Board voted to um, recommend the following goals to the city commission um, which would be a hundred percent clean renewable energy for municipal and community-wide uh, according to the following schedule which is included in your um, in your uh, agenda packet uh, which would be uh, by 2025 for all um, um, electricity for municipal operations that would include any buildings or any bills that the city pays for electricity um, by 2040 for all energy sectors in municipal operations and so that goes beyond electricity and includes uh, things like natural gas um, uh, transportation um, fuel and, and things like that heating and cooling uh, related uh, energy and then it goes on to include um, some goals for the community wide so 2035 for all electricity uh, provided to the community would be 100 percent renewable and by 2050 all energy sectors within the community would be renewable so the city commission uh, this exact group in fact received this recommendation from the sustainability advisory board on december 17th of 2019 and you all directed staff to draft an ordinance to achieve um, the that 100 percent renewable goal and subsequently develop a plan uh, for how to achieve those goals as a part of the climate action and adaptation plan that will be developed this year so uh, so before you today you have the ordinance that you directed staff to uh, develop um, and uh, I'm here to answer any questions about that um, but you have the information in front of you any questions for Jasmine is there any reason that these numbers couldn't be bumped up is there some something to consider or something that I'm not seeing where these numbers couldn't be um, bumped up um, that is definitely up for discussion the dates that are included in um, in the recommendation was based on uh, what other municipalities have done okay. um, there are communities that have pledged to achieve some of these goals sooner um, 2050 is really the max goal uh, so you know there's nobody setting targets beyond 2050 um, but these date these uh, dates or years were selected based on other munis similar municipalities there's no reason why that can't be adjusted um, I will add that uh, the greenhouse gas emissions goals for the city of Lawrence have 2050 as that target date of reducing our emissions by 80 percent but from the 2005 baseline and so this is in alignment with that that's not to say that those goals don't deserve to be revisited as well because it just seems that with technology going the way it is it's moving along pretty quickly so it just it just seems to me that in fact we have the technology right now for every citizen in Lawrence who has who gets electricity they could get it from wind power right now right 
So that that is an available option through Evergy. Yes, um, it is. To opt into that. Mm-hmm. So I, I guess I, I would just be interested in um, modifying these dates because I do think the, the technology continues to escalate and that there's going to be new options out there and some of this we can do today. Okay. What, are, what are some of the factors that we would consider in looking at feasibility and stepping that up? So for the goals related to electricity, uh, that is much easier to make progress on. Uh, One, because we have one provider um, for uh, the city of Lawrence. Uh, So that would require working with Evergy to increase our our portfolio in terms of renewable energy. Um, They have recently made some statements about uh, increasing their uh, renewable portfolio as a company. So that is much closer on the horizon than uh, the all energy sectors that just gets more complicated because you know that's also talking about cars and vehicles and so there's lots of different more players involved in all energy sectors uh, and would require some uh, infrastructure changes as well so if we are moving towards electric vehicles then we also need to think about do we have the infrastructure to support charging for those types of vehicles. So there's an economic consideration as well. I, I know when I change to 100% wind energy for my house, I'm paying more per month um, for my electric bill. And so understanding the fiscal impacts, I think, would be a factor that we would consider in that as well. Mm-hmm. So I guess that's, that's where I'm at, is I would like to see the numbers brought down a little bit. Maybe in public comment. Yeah. OK. All right. Sorry. Any other, any other questions? Thanks, Jasmine. Thank you. All right, we will open it up for public comment. My name is Teresa Wilkie. I want to commend the Sustainability Advisory Board for doing a really good job. I don't see anything in the proposed ordinance that makes it illegal to beat those numbers. No, no penalty if we do it faster than what they say, or slower. <laughs> Uh, Well, I don't know. I mean, slower, it's in an ordinance by this date. So if you get it done sooner. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. My name is Jackie Carroll. I serve officially as the chair of the Sustainability Advisory Board, um, but tonight I come with my own comments. So I have three things that I want to share. Um, First of all, there have been a lot of really important reasons to come to City Commission lately. Um, Among this, I know there's work being being done toward becoming a sanctuary city and the efforts to decriminalize houselessness. So in general, I'm just very proud to be part of a community working on these things. Um, Second, I wanted to address a letter that you all received um, on this item asking for natural gas to be included as a clean energy source. I'm going to read an excerpt from Shuta's Katz Martinez's book, We Rise. Um, He is an indigenous climate activist and youth director of uh, Earth Earth Guardians, excuse me. In short, big oil and gas has tried to fool us into thinking that fracking for gas has about half the climate impact of coal because it gives off roughly half the carbon emissions when it burns. However, looking at the full process, fracking often has more of a climate impact than coal because of methane leaks. Over a 20 year period, methane is 100 times worse as a heat trapping gas than carbon dioxide. The health impacts of fracking make it a terrible alternative on its own, but combined with the increased climate impact, it is completely the wrong direction for global energy. I just wanted to give you something to keep in mind um, around that item. Uh, Lastly, SAB is the official body to advise you um, on sustainability issues. However, there are very educated and passionate groups um, in our community who are different in that they were not appointed by the mayor. Um, I believe we are all one. We're all fighting uh, for a livable and um, abundant future. Um, And I ask that you take their feedback as seriously as you do SABs. Um, I personally very much support their work, their expertise, and their passion, and feel honored to work beside them. Um, 
I, I know there were specific questions around the dates. Um, I have absolutely no concern moving those dates up. Um, as you mentioned, there is no penalty for not meeting them on time, and I believe um, there are specific recommendations that have been presented to you to consider. So I will leave you with that. Thank you for the time. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ruby McKinnon Love. I live at 8th and Mississippi. Sorry, you're out of lines here. Um, what we decide in this room and in rooms like this across the country will determine everything. Climate change is not an isolated issue. It colors every choice we make. We stand at a crossroads. We can choose hope or despair. We can choose to build our community for the future or to salvage mere parts of it. In the year 2000, I was five years old. That year, we had 30 years to act, and we didn't. When I learned what climate change was in 2005, we had 20 years to act, and we didn't. When I became too scared to read climate news in 2010, we had 20 years to act, and we didn't. When I decided to fight for my future, we had 10 years. This time, we have to act. I'm scared to critique this plan because I know that doing something is always better than doing nothing, and I don't want to lose even a plan that is too slow, but it is too slow. I understand why this plan sets its target at 2050. It's doable. It doesn't scare too many people or push them too hard. It's practical. But I ask you to consider, is it practical to let the river rise and our basements flood? Is it practical to let our farmers lose their crops and fall into hopelessness? Is it practical to pay more and more for disaster cleanup every year? Isn't it practical to do the hard work up front? Isn't it practical to create good paying jobs in our community, putting people to work building renewable infrastructure and retrofitting our buildings? Isn't it practical to listen to the science and the data and the economics of responding to a changing climate? I believe in you, and I'm asking you to believe in me when I tell you that our shared community will support you in the decision to move boldly on this issue. I'm asking you to consider moving up the timeline to enable our community to make this transition by 2030. Thank you. Thank you. Other public comment? Uh, Mayor and City Commissioners, uh, thank you for the opportunity to, to talk about this ordinance. Uh, my name is Jerry Watkins. I'm the General Manager for Black Hills Energy. Uh, our office is at 601 North Iowa uh, here in Lawrence. I have overall responsibility for our business across the state, and uh, we proudly serve over 115,000 customers uh, across 65 Kansas communities, including Lawrence. Altogether, the Black Hills Energy family serves 1.2 million customers. Um, natural gas and electric customers across eight states. So we have been a key community and energy partner uh, with the city for nearly a hundred years, uh, providing safe, reliable, and economical service to the city's residences and businesses that we serve. In line with the spirit of the city and its vision for the future, we want you to know that Black Hills supports pursuing all sensible paths to utilizing clean energy and reducing greenhouse gas emissions while continuing to deliver uh, safe, affordable, and reliable service to our customers. We appreciate your vision and goal for clean energy and believe a collaborative partnership with all community stakeholders is, key, is the key to success. Natural gas has already reduced global carbon emissions by more than 50% across the country and will continue to play a part in reducing emissions while providing reliability going forward. This ordinance is written sets a goal that would eliminate the use of natural gas and other carbon-based energy from being utilized in Lawrence. And we believe sustainability should focus on a partnership with renewables, electricity, natural gas, new technology, and the smart use of our existing infrastructure system. Domestically produced and abundant, natural gas remains a strong value for residential, commercial, and industrial energy needs. In 2019, the typical resident, residential customer in Kansas could heat their home, have hot water, and cook their meals for less than $2 a day. $2 a day. That's, that's economical. 
uh, the 100%, um, well, I'm sorry, eliminating direct use of natural gas will impact residents, businesses, and could stifle economic growth. The 100% renewable energy policy uh, mentions in, in its conclusion that there are seemingly infinite combinations possible to achieve a 100% renewable goal. Why limit the future uh, or future technology or innovative efforts to develop alternative fuel sources by eliminating natural gas as an option? Clean energy in the natural gas world means, one, reduce methane emissions, which we are doing through replacement of obsolete infrastructure. Uh, methane capture, uh, we'll talk about renewable natural gas, uh, such as uh, capturing methane from landfills, treatment, plon treatment ponds, uh, feed yards, anaerobic digesters, and biomass facilities. Uh, Black Hills has uh, currently 15 RNG projects going on across the regions that we serve, and 60 more in process. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you. Hello. My name is Walt Onesforge. Um, speaking, first I'd like to thank some of the speakers. They've been very elegant and I will try. Um, I just want to say that it's disgusting to me that Black Hills is here this evening um, talking about clean natural gas when we all should know um, because we can feel the earthquakes from Oklahoma that there isn't anything clean about it. Um, I think that it's clear that energy companies in our area aren't protecting the consumers of those products, but they're protecting shareholders, and that's <coughs> evidenced by their presence. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Matthew Dunn, 555 West 6th Street. I'd also like to point out that Black Hills Energy has been contributing to the problem that we are now trying to solve with this plan for 100 years, so keeping that in mind. So our current way of business must not be at business as usual. We're facing a climate crisis and it's already having impacts on us here in Lawrence. 100 and 500 year floods are now seeming to become one and five year floods. Our low income and houseless community members are facing ever harsher weather and increasingly expensive resources. Without drastic action now, these climate phenomena will only get worse. The overwhelming evidence provided by scientists affirms that we only have 10 years globally to reach carbon net zero. 2030. As you all know, the current plan only achieves 100% renewable energy community-wide by 2050. I'm concerned that a large portion of this plan will, attempt, will also attempt to place the burden of paying for climate change solutions, such as by developing re renewable energy infrastructure onto Laurentians via the energy wind option, uh, which adds a small fee to each monthly energy bill. And I have, I have serious concerns about how trustworthy Evergy will be in this process, specifically about how they might exploit our most valuable, our most vulnerable community members during this effort, so that they can further profit off the climate, that, off the climate crisis that they helped contribute, cause. Excuse me. So the Kansas News Service recently published an article in which they reported that cities which own and maintain their own streetlight systems, that is, which they purchased from, then Westar. Uh, are now paying much less for the same energy than cities where Evergy operates the city's streetlights. So this is because cities which own their own streetlights replace their old bulbs with LED bulbs and solve the savings immediately via lower uh, energy bills. Evergy also installed LED bulbs in cities like Lawrence, but rather than passing the, along the savings to us here in Lawrence, Evergy did not charge us less money for the streetlight services. They did not charge the city less. Uh, instead, they just pocketed the savings. All right, so with this in mind, uh, some action is better than complete inaction. I urge you to pass this plan, even though the current timeline does not align with the urgency of the climate crisis. However, we must also ensure that the brunt of the costs for this are not passed on to those with the least means and those who contributed to this problem the least. 
Further, we must also take drastic actions to protect and expand our local carbon sinks, such as the Baker Wetlands, Prairies, and Clinton State Park. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Gretchen Otten, and I live in the Brook Creek neighborhood. I'm a member of the Sunrise Movement, but we've got a few people here from this organization who have already spoken. So I'm going to speak as a community member, as a nurse, and as a member of the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments. I am an ICU nurse passionate about community health and a sustainable future. The sooner we transition away from fossil fuels, the better it will be for the health of our residents. As the climate changes, incidences of childhood asthma increase, heat-related illnesses like rhabdomyolysis increases, even heart attacks increase. Not to mention the insect-borne illnesses of our hotter, more flood-prone air flood areas are Lyme disease, West Nile, and even Zika is making its way up here. These all impact farmers, communities of color, the homeless, the children and the elderly disproportionately. You should also know there is planning taking place nationally not just to adapt to climate related illnesses but increase civil unrest due to climate changing. Not just, it's changing not just temperatures and the weather and bugs but it changes society itself. This just popped up randomly in a webinar I took today. Healthcare workers are starting to prepare for stomach churning worst case scenarios. So I agree with the 100% renewables ordinance. With this one caveat, the sooner the better. Please. The Lancet, the American Medical Association, um, among other uh, national organizations have called this a public health emergency. 2050 is too late for emergency action. The IPCC says massive climate change needs to happen by 2030, and I wish our goals were more focused on that date. I need your aggressive action to keep me from having to leave my career as an ICU nurse and to take on more of a disaster nurse. Thank you. Hi, good evening. My name is Michael Allman. I'm with uh, the Sustainability Action Network. And you have a letter from our organization in your packet. I hope you got a chance to read. Considering that climate catastrophes keep escalating worldwide, driving up our cost of living for crop failures, disaster relief, and insurance premiums, we're grateful that Lawrence is taking action for climate protection. The choices before you will be difficult and admittedly expensive, but nowhere near as expensive as paying for climate disasters again and again and again. To avoid the irreversible climate chaos anticipated by 99% of scientists, Ordinance 9744 must be more aggressive in order to reach our goals by 2030, not 2050. These goals are the keystone for all of our plans they will set the bar for whether the Climate Emergency Response Plan, the Strategic Plan, and Plan 2040 will effectively address the climate crisis or not. These are the goals I'm referring to that we would like to see the numbers bumped up to, as Commissioner Larson mentioned. Next slide. <laughs> Uh, 
that's good enough. Um, so don't be distracted by false solutions, such as the claims that natural gas is a bridge fuel to a carbon-free future. 100% renewables means no more burning fossil fuels. Black Hills Energy would have that mythical bridge extended to 2050 and beyond. In contrast, Evergy just announced they are increasing wind generation by 660 megawatts and retiring all their Kansas coal plants, although not as fast as enough as in my opinion. The most effective way to keep fossil fuels in the ground is to consume less stuff, particularly plastic stuff, which is made from fossil fuels. The key to buying less stuff, while well, not tanking the economy, which is obviously a worry for the financial impact, um, is, is a business model that sells services, not commodities. For example, enlightened utilities sell heat and light through efficiency and insulation programs. Transportation companies can sell mobility rather than vehicles, such as rideshare services. And packaging companies, oh, I'm sorry, uh, can sell transportation by providing reusable containers. The possibilities are endless. Thank you, Michael. But for American ingenuity to flourish, first there must be ambition, and ambition will be triggered by ambitious goals. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi, my name is Dawn Hawkins. I live at 522 North 955 Road. Um, I applaud the commission and the city staff for making a commitment to address the climate crisis and pollution caused by dirty fossil fuels. I support this ordinance in general, except for the timeline. A goal of 2050 for 100% renewable energy is quaint and really only gives lip service to the community's desire to address the problems. As we know from the 2019 Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report, we don't have 30 years. We have about 10 to prevent global climate <clears throat> catastrophe. We know that it is possible technologically to switch to renewable energy and that the impediments are really only political and social. We also know that it is now cheaper to run on wind and solar than coal, and not making the switch directly costs cast, uh, ratepayers. There are already cities in the U.S. and around the world and even entire countries that currently run on 100% or nearly 100% renewable energy and many more that have made commitments to do so in much shorter time frames than this ordinance proposes. Laurentians are hardy and resourceful. We can do this too. Let's save our pocketbooks, our natural resources, and our planet by making a commitment that actually affects change. As the city is currently in the process of strate strategic planning, this is crucial now, not decades from now. I urge you to reconsider the timeline and, and adopt instead the timeline recommended by the S Sustainability Action Network. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Caitlin McDermott. I live at 1000. Mississippi. There's been a lot of talk here tonight on real emergencies that we are facing. The first gentleman who spoke tonight spoke of emergencies surrounding race in our nation and society. I spoke of the emergency facing our community members seeking shelter. Now the issue before the commissioners is one of global emergency. Our planet needs our urgent help. There is a climate emergency. I urge the commission to fast track the timeline in ordinance 9744. Thank you. I'm Joe Douglas. I live at 2804 Oxford Road. I think it's a cause for celebration that we're even talking about this topic tonight, the topic of not 
are we going to have 100% uh, renewable energy, but when? Uh, I mean, this is so far ahead of where we were not, not that many years ago. Um, it's a daunting task. And, and the idea of doing it even faster than is suggested in, in the plan is even more daunting. But I, I would suggest that the key is, is making the decision to do it. Um, in, in my career as a psychiatrist, I often had, had the, the, the privilege of, of knowing people who were exceedingly distressed with how their lives were going but who were able somehow to make the decision that their lives were going to change. And they didn't know how they were going to do it, but they committed themselves to making the change and to doing whatever was necessary. Um, and I think that's where we are now. The, the, the decision is there to be made. Um, there also is there's an old adage in psychotherapy that it's easiest to make changes in the midst of a crisis. Well, the, the good news is we've got a crisis. Um, climate change is not coming, it is here, and it's, and it's uh, getting worse. Um, so basically, I agree fully with, with the, um, the, the goals uh, that Michael Allman uh, showed you. Uh, I, I think the stakes are really high in, 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 the, in dealing with climate change, I think, we, I think we need to make our goals just as high. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Nancy Muma Habib, and I'm here, I live at 1217 Inverness Drive. I'm part of the Sustainability Action Network, and so I'd like to say I fully support moving this up to the 2030 deadline that, that is everybody here has been calling for. I think that the Sustainability Advisory Board has done a terrific job, has laid out all the reasons why we should do this. And so I just want to continue to emphasize how important it is that we do this in a timely fashion and make sure that we get this go done by 2030. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again for uh, having the time to listen to all of us. And I'm just going to agree with Joe. It is a great time to celebrate. I want to say uh, I'm here representing on behalf of Lettuce, which some of you know, but Lettuce is a green team network of nine at this point, And we apparently have more coming on, but we're of uh, the faith traditions of Jewish and Muslim, uh, Catholic, Protestant, and Unitarian Universalist. And I, I just want to say, uh, along with the rest of it, there is a sense of urgency, of course, but how do we implement this is the same thing that uh, I have always wondered over and over again. And I'm going to be presumptuous enough to say I hope that the city uh, will join with the expertise in this uh, community that can have it happen. Uh, we have a plan, we have a policy, now how do you see it happen? Uh, I think there is a model even for you. I'm excited to know that you are part of the Kansas City or KC Climate uh, Coalition uh, through this area and they have a climate action playbook which it's worth reading. The climate action playbook breaks down all the areas in terms of its headings and then it lists solutions for each of them. And as you know that has come after a lot of study within the Kansas City area and they specify each area. If we had a group of men and women in this community who know what we're talking about and could take these areas and implement them in specific ways, the Sustainability Action uh, Advisory Board is not going to be able to do that. That's not within their purview. But to have some group that's selected by you, appointed, and I think it could happen. But that's rather presumptuous on my part. I think the other part that's important for me, and I want to let you know that publicly, uh, Lettuce would like to pledge 
uh, that we will go about educating people on a 100% renewable policy. And part of the reason I say that is because the experience we had at one of the green teams at First Presbyterian, we had uh, the chair, uh, Jack Carroll, came and spoke to us. After people heard her speak and explain 100% renewable energy, it was like, oh, we can do this. If we can have other groups, and we pledge to encourage all faith communities to do that in Lawrence, to get educated and say, we can do that. Otherwise, we're going to have all these rumors, all these rumors about what can't be done. So I think that's important, and that's the Rotary, the 4-H clubs, all the nonprofits, the library, whatever, to begin an educational program so people will leave that kind of experience and say, we are able to do this and be more open to supporting what we, as I celebrate again, the city has decided to do. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, um, Mayor and Commissioners. My name's Karen Pagel Miners. I've lived in Lawrence since 1992. Um, all of the comments have been uh, so eloquent and in thinking about what I wanted to say tonight. It's like we know what needs to be done. Um, and um, I, I, I mainly want to come with a question for you, and that is what would, what will it take, what will compel uh, the commission to bump up that date, uh, to or bump down up the date to uh, 2030? What will it take? That's my question. Thank you. Hi, I'm Chris Flowers. Um, I would just like to ask, are there any incentives the commission could include to encourage the city, the city to reach the goal faster than 2050, instead of just talking about like um, punishment for not reaching it? Like, um, my mother was a librarian at a school, and one year she set out a reading goal for her students with the agreement she would shave her head if they reached it. That year, the kids read more than they ever did, and she was left bald. Maybe if the city manager would shave his head if we reached the goal by 2030, we'd see the city work harder than ever before to see their boss left bald. And also, um, if we're going to be... Um, talking about the environment, I think w the city at some point needs to to bring up like population control. Like to me it just seems part of the environmental problems is we have way too many people and we need to quit having as many kids and I think the city needs to at least look at that issue also at some point in the future. Thank you. Any other public comment on this item? Okay, thank you. We'll bring it back to the commission. Well, I'll just cut to the chase here. Yeah, um, yeah I'm, I'm in favor of modifying those dates to a certain degree. Um, I, I support the ordinance, but I do think that um, I've just come up with a few numbers on, num on goal number one, which was 2025 keep that at 2025 goal number two um, which was all energy sectors for the city it's at 2040 but set that to 2035 goal number three all community elect electric all community wide um, move that to 2030 and then the last one which is everything basically 2035 And I, I mean, I don't do this lightly, um, but I, I do think that if we can push ourselves harder to try to meet these goals sooner, it, it just leaves that much less room for the potential just to forget about this. I mean, you think about what we did with the 2009 plan, we didn't even think about it for how many years before we finally really started paying attention to it so I don't want it to get lost and I know that the ordinance does point out that we're going to come up with some sort of crystallizing our goals on that which I think is very important to keep it in front of us but I would be interested in just moving it up to those dates thank you 
not opposed to it. Um, I think those factors that we talked about, and you know, I think we also can talk about, for example, a fleet of electric vehicles and the infrastructure that would be required for that. Um, we also have a fleet of vehicles <laughs> that have some value um, in resale as well, which would mitigate those costs to some ex extent. I would, I would ask staff to consider those dates um, and, and bring back anything that they want us to consider in regard to that um, for a second reading. Yeah. Yeah, I do, I do think a key component here that we didn't talk about but SAD brought it up was the education part. I think that we could, could um, through the city, develop a strong education program, a marketing program to constantly keep this in front of the community, to encourage folks to switch over to the wind energy as well as, you know, as new programs come up, us take a really hard look at those options for wind or solar. I guess, um, well, a couple things. One, I'm, I'm one of those people that needs some more education on this. But the question, you know, was asked, what would it take to move this up? And what would staff look at, kind of a cool age of that, what would staff look at to bring back? And I brought this up when we considered it earlier. I mean, I guess I thought that's what the climate plan was going to be doing. I mean, we're about to go through a whole process to figure out how we're going to reach these goals and implement this plan. We're going to be, you know, working on that. And and I think if we can come up with a plan that says we can do it by X time, then that would cause me to say, yes, let's do it by X time. But um, I guess I'm I guess I'm also one of this I mean twenty thirty five make sure I understand this, education, all energy sectors, by 2035, that means no gas, hot water heaters, no cars, no Definitely all electric cars in the, in the town. Do you, do you stop people at the gates of town if they're coming from Kansas City? I mean, do you try to block I-70? I mean, what's well, I, the... I think, I think you're getting a little... Little well, I'm asking the question, yeah. I mean, there's nothing in there now that says if we don't meet the goals, nothing yeah. happens. So my, my only point is we have, a, we have a plan going. I mean, I, I, I think we're ready to see the plan. But Well, it, I mean, it actually says in this ordinance yeah. how this would be handled and that it is talk, says development strategies and action steps to achieve these goals mm -hmm. outlined above will be integrated into the climate action plan. So having a having an overall goal and then uh, putting the, that process within the plan itself is is the way to. Okay. Yeah. I'm certainly comfortable with what they've what was presented to us. I don't think I'd support moving them up until after we've seen the plan. But. I'm just putting the ordinance back up just for your reference um, if anybody needs to reference that um, and I will say uh, you know in terms of staff considering what changes to the dates would mean um, like you all have discussed the strategies uh, will be developed in the plan so the the dates are less important to staff on this is we we need that direction from you all um, and then we can work to work towards those goals those dates could you you said the dates are less important to staff but I mean these were recommended by the sustainability advisory oh, okay. board and so I'm just saying whatever dates you are it's not be it's not 2050 because we have information about that it would take this amount of time to get to that point um, to 100% uh, renewable for all sectors. Um, that date was based on you know other recommendations from similar cities, uh, and you know there was thought put into that. But I'm just saying, if if for some reason you all decide that you want to uh, change that to 2035, then that would just the implication would be that. Uh, during our planning process, we would be working towards tw 2035 instead of 2050. Yeah. So I'm, I'm just saying by um, bringing this back to you for a second reading, 
we as staff won't have that much more context to inform your decision on the dates. So if you go, when you go through the planning process of, of the climate action plan, can the dates be modified at that point? I would, if, if you feel as though you've, you've got it, your goals are set out that you can meet those? I think that's that's definitely a possibility just recognizing that this is an ordinance and so it would require if if that is something that changes during the process it would require an update to the ordinance with those new dates okay yeah from my understanding mm -hmm. thanks we could all commit to shaving our heads if we meet it 10 years <laughs> earlier <laughs> It'd mean more for some people than others. <laughs> I've shaved my head before. I am fine with it. I, I think you're on board. You're, you're the longest hair up here. <laughs> it comes back. It's all right. I, I think understanding that we can, you know, we would be able to change those dates as, as you developed a plan. And if you can come up with some processes that would allow us to move those dates up at that point, then I would encourage that. Yeah. And I would say that um, somebody referenced the, the Casey Climate action mm -hmm. I always forget their name um, but they have a lot of the technical solutions in there we we know a lot of the technical solutions so it's it's part of it is the the will of the community to actually um, step forward and and make those choices so um, like you referenced earlier Commissioner Larson we have some of the tools right now to get mm -hmm. to meet some of these goals it's just a matter of are, is that where we want to mm -hmm. allocate resources? Do, is there political will to do that? Yeah, yeah. The the, the climate plan would kind of outline some of the tools and right. how quickly we can do that. Mm -hmm. That's fine. Yeah, I mean, I've looked at the Can See actual. I mean, plan. I've looked at that. I'm I'm a big supporter of it, and I'm a big supporter of of making progress towards that I guess um, you know I guess I'm hoping as, as it says in the procedure the development I mean, we're working on a climate action adaption plan engagement process and then adopt a plan so I'm looking forward to that process I think it's going to be a big very important deal <laughs> I mean, very 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 important um, but until I mean again and maybe it's just my lack of education I mean I, I was sarcastic a little bit earlier I mean <laughs> part of it's like my lack of education of not knowing yeah. how we would get there and preemptively saying that's our goal without knowing the process to get there I mean even as easy as you know I, again I don't know these things people out here probably do um, you know if I have a brand new hot water heater that is a gas I mean it, how am I replacing that and in, in my house and who's paying for that and how we're we doing that I don't know how we get from here to there on some of those things and we have to have a plan for that mm -hmm. and maybe we decide people have 20 years to do that instead of 15 and then we can't meet, meet this goal I, I mean without seeing those processes it's hard for me to say you know and, where we're at so that's just what I'm thinking and based on my experience is that um, wherever we set these goals at we won't know whether we can even meet them until 10 5, 10, 15 years down the road because you just don't know how quickly the technology is going to catch up. And it's, and it's moving very quickly. But even once we do this climate plan, we won't have the specifics as to how we're going to, we can actually nail that goal. But I, I think, you know, I'm kind of of the volition that let's make these goals really, really strong and, and push us, push us to do, to do this, even if we might miss these goals. But let's push it. I would just refer back to the the greenhouse gas inventory goals that were established, um, you know, over ten years ago. Uh, similar process in that uh, there wasn't a a uh, necessarily a roadmap to um, uh, technically see that we would meet those goals uh, at that point. So um, the the 2050 was the horizon of those yeah. goals for 80 percent reduction. Um, at that time, we didn't have specific plan on, you know, if we if we do everything in this plan, we still weren't sure if we were going to get there or not. So um, I see it as a similar spot in that that we're at right now in in terms of um, setting what that target 
goal is and what is that horizon and then like you said we're, we're still not going to know exactly uh, how far it will take to how, how how much it will take to get get to that point but we can work towards it I think one piece of this conversation to keep in mind and I think you touched on it when you're talking about like a water heater that you just bought is mm -hmm. that folks experiencing poverty have the most difficulty adapting mm -hmm. to those alternatives and simultaneously they're the most negatively impacted by oh climate gosh. change and so how do we ensure that our whole community can be part of this without disparately impacting financially our communities that are experiencing poverty so I, I want that to be present in that conversation I want to be aware of that and be very thoughtful and intentional around how we address that as well yeah it's almost danged if you do and danged if you don't yeah so do we have a motion then or do we want to continue talking about the dates Good. How does other people feel about changing the dates or just keeping them? What do you guys want? I'm okay with changing them. Just to clarify, you said 2025, keep it? Yeah. 2040 goes to 2035 instead. Mm -hmm. 2035, number three, goes to 2030. And 2050 goes to 2035. Yeah. I would be in favor of that as long as staff has an opportunity to provide some feedback yeah. to us as well. And during the, the climate plan process, if they look at that and say there's just absolutely no way, then, then we could modify it then. Yeah, we say we can always make them earlier, but we can also make them later. Mm -hmm. But this right. sets an audacious goal. It does. That's what, that's what I'm kind of shooting for is something just to really to push us to try harder. So. Would you like to make the motion then? Okay, I'll make a, let's see where we're at. A motion to adopt on first reading ordinance number seven nine seven four four with the following changes to the goals. Goal number one, uh, change to 2025. Goal number two to 2035. Goal number three to 2030. And goal number four to 2035. Second. Motion by Commissioner Larson, second by Commissioner Shipley. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Passes four to one. Okay, so we will move on to item number three now. On this one, um, since we are opening the public hearing and continuing that, Sherry, are we going to have a, well, maybe, maybe you're the person to ask this, but are we going to have a presentation on that this evening or will we be waiting until we bring that back? So I don't need to read those two paragraphs. <laughs> That's my question. Don't need to read. Okay. Okay. Okay, so our action this evening is to open the public hearing regarding the recommendations from the Public Incentive <coughs> Advisory Committee and Affordable Housing Advisory Board um, for the request from Tony Krisnich for a neighborhood revitalization area, industrial revolu revenue bond, sales tax exemption, and reimbursement of a portion of city fees for a mixed use project at 800 Pennsylvania Street. So we'll open the public hearing this evening, continue it until March 17th. Move oh, that we open the public hearing. Second. Motion by Commissioner Bully, second by Commissioner Larson. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. I move that we continue the public hearing until March 17th, 2020. Second. Motion by Commissioner Bully, second by Commissioner Larson. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. Okay, so at this point, we will move on to commission items. Do we have any future agenda items to add? Do we have any future work session items to add? Do we have any other items to discuss? Um, we recently returned the uh, bylaws for the Special Alcohol uh, Fund Advisory Board to them for their consideration of uh, Resolution 7224. After we did that, I was uh, made aware that there is one position on that board that is a specified position that's a United Way position and 
uh, you know, I was con contacted by a constituent who said we should really consider whether we want to have a designated seat for United Way on that board. Um, we wouldn't be kicking anybody off if we just took that designation away. But essentially what we'd be doing would be opening up the entire board to the entire public and not favoring one grantor. There are other grantors in this community who aren't represented on the board. So um, I wanted to bring that to the commission's attention and invite um, discussion of that at some point. This will be coming back to us so we could you know, provide some additional direction on that. I'm not sure exactly how we do that, but I, I felt obliged to bring it up tonight. Would it be something that we could request the board to consider? I think that would be appropriate, but again, I'm, I'm raising the issue. I don't know the, the you know, appropriate way for us to handle that since it's coming up in a commission item. We haven't given any notice on it or anything like that. But mm -hmm. this will come back to us when we get the bylaws again. So I, mm -hmm. you know, I'd ask staff if they have any suggestions or recommendations on that. That's really yours. Okay. I don't have any technical advice on you. Okay. <laughs> well, I mean, I guess what I'm saying is process-wise. If, if it's established by ordinance, we'll just have to do a new ordinance. If it's by resolution, do a new resolution. And okay. if it's not any of that, then it may be something that that board can do. I don't know off the top of my head okay. whether it's in the... Well, I mean, I, I invite that as an issue for our consideration as we continue with looking at that advisory board. Okay. Yeah, I mean, if it's in the bylaws, that's coming back to us anyway. Right. If it's in the right. ordinance, we'd have to look at it differently. Yeah. So we'll wait until the bylaws come back to us and then... Well, we can research the ordinance. I'll do that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So in, in, in your scenario then, when it does come back to us, that would be a consideration staff will have thought about and give us information at that time so we don't... Well, I mean, twice. you know, the question... Well, it would be best to do it all at once, yeah, right? Yeah, that's what I'm... And we've returned this to the um, board for their consideration of 7224 since they passed the draft bylaws. I think, you know, obviously they could take a look at it and weigh in on it. We'd consider what they thought, too. So we would direct staff to have their liaison bring that to the board to consider before they bring the bylaws back to us. That would be us. good, yeah. We'll add that to the discussion, and then uh, assuming they bring something forward, we'll be prepared to offer suggested language if that's your okay. pleasure. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Hort. I did think of something. Um, so we're going to be having come back to us the panhandling and, and camping ordinance is that going to also involve having the um, number of people in the church change that number changed that ordinance changed was that part of our anybody remember i thought it was that's a separate ordinance it's not in the two that we were. <coughs> <coughs> i just don't remember what yeah i don't see it on our or a future it, it was part of the direction at the okay. session okay so March 17th is when you're coming back with the panhandling it is is when uh, city attorney office is coming back with panhandling and camping and we will also have some um, more information for you on the temporary shelters okay okay thank you anything else that excuse me commissioners that uh, the uh, special alcohol funding advisory board that is done by ordinance and that position okay. is set forth in an ordinance okay. so we just would have to amend the ordinance okay. to remove that okay. position okay. thank you Ren. okay can we um, just on that on the agenda items future agenda, on that March 17th could we add that in there that we're going to be revisiting that the church if we could because I've had people ask me when is that coming back and I didn't didn't know so we moved on to the city manager's report. Oh, I guess so. Sorry. <laughs> that's okay. I think that's a natural transition. Thank you for leading us on that path. <laughs> These former mayors, you know. They <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I get ahead of myself sometimes. All right. So are we are we finished with commission? Are there any other commission items? Okay. Let's go on to the city manager's report. I, I don't have anything to really highlight that much. You saw the sales tax report, and that was uh, yeah. that's the disappointing side of where we're, we'd normally be on. But you know, these go up and down, uh, and we've had some good news recently uh, that led into this. So stay tuned on that. Um, 
uh, just want to highlight some good work of the um, accounts receivable, the work that was done with the finance staff and trying to clear those up. Um, that's it. Let's stand for any questions. Any questions? Okay, we'll open up for public comment. Okay. Thank you, Craig. Uh, moving on to the calendar. Anything to address there? I, um, we got a little bit of feedback from staff about um, the knee and my assembly, and I didn't know when we would want to have a discussion about that amongst ourselves. What is the date for that? April. April 20th, I believe. April 20th. Do we want to talk about that tonight? Take the recommendation. Well, maybe. It's up to you, Mayor. You want to talk yeah. Mayor? It's, I'm, I'm going to go with the will of the commission. If there are <laughs> three commissioners or more who want to have this conversation, then we will. Um, and if there are not, I acknowledge that it's late. It's a <laughs> relatively other stuff late to do. meeting. Yeah. So if, if I were given my druthers, but I don't want to deprioritize something that is a priority for someone else, I would, I would prefer to wait till March 3rd. Um, but I'm also open to the will of the commission on that one. Would it be possible for us to put it on the calendar now or for our next meeting, just so it's on the calendar. We don't have to talk about necessarily how we're going to handle it, but just make sure that people know it's on our calendar because we'll, some of us will be there. Okay. What are thoughts around that? Yeah, I'm fine. Yeah, with let's that. do that. Put it on the calendar. We can talk about who goes later. Okay. Yeah. Is that mm -hmm. consensus based alrightiness? Okay. Um, in that case, we'll move on. We have an executive session. Do we have a motion? Uh, I move to recess into executive session for approximately 15 minutes to discuss privileged legal communications from the city's attorneys regarding a potential lawsuit and pending litigation pursuant to KSA 75-4319B2. The justification for the executive session is to keep attorney-client privilege matters confidential at this time. At the end of the executive session, the City Commission will resume its regular meeting in the City Commission room. Second. Motion by Commissioner Bully, second by Commissioner Larson. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right, passes unanimously. We'll be back in 15 minutes.
say that? I think so. Oh, we're waiting for 15 minutes. We're sitting quietly for 30 seconds. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> You're like, come on. Come on. Okay, we will go ahead and get started. We are back and we have nothing to report this evening. Do we have a motion to adjourn? Move to adjourn. Second. Motion by Commissioner Bully, second by Commissioner Larson. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, and passes unanimously. See Larson. Hello, Commissioner Larson. <laughs>